It is Winter Meetings Week on FT Lab, and we're doing our meetings virtually because it's 2023. Let's run it. Braun, Kipnis, and Kratz on a Monday on Stadium. So, Kip, sometimes I think Kratz and Przinsky and me are like doing this every day, so we're too close to it. I read a lot of people saying, what a terrible offseason. Nothing has happened. It's so boring. We feel like it's been really busy and... The manager stuff with council and a billion other manager openings. There's been a few signings, a ton of speculation. From your perspective, is this offseason going okay for you or do you feel super bored? I feel like it hasn't started yet. Or it might have just started yesterday a little bit with the, the Mariners trade. But I think if you're – when you look for good offseasons, you look for big names to be on the market. And I think we got that this year, don't we? We got some I mean, of the biggest names in the game. Also – Shohei Otani is a free agent. He's still a free agent, right? You have We're gonna the, the biggest name. You have uh, Cy Young winners. You have Soto. You have all these names being thrown around. It just hasn't happened yet. So it, it, it's going. But once it happens, then it happens, Kratz. So the speculation's good and fun, especially if you can say whatever the hell you want. Like if you want to rip the Mariners trade, which I'm sure we'll do coming up with Ryan Divish. But you know what I'm saying, Kratz? Like the the anticipation, the speculation is often better than when the news actually happens. Because then it happens, and then there's a press conference, and then we move on from speculating. That's it. And then we just have to get the comment of why you didn't go all in for Shohei. Why you didn't go all <laughs> in for Soto. Like, we have two, to me, two of the top, I'm going to say seven players in the game possibly available. I, I mean, not possibly. They're both available. Shohei's available. Soto's available. There's yep. not... It's not like speculative, like, well, they might trade Dylan Cease. They might trade Corbin Burns. Not sure. They have to trade Soto because of the money. To me, it's been exciting. But again, we're here. We're here a lot. And I just think once it happens, like some people were saying, ah, maybe, maybe Shohei gets it done near the winter meetings or the next week. I'm like, I'd love it if he gave us like a December 20th gift kind of thing. Like uh, maybe, maybe like a solid Tuesday. Somewhere in there. Well, I, I texted him. He got right back to me. He said Friday he's making his decision. This Friday. Is that we should have a little we should have a little office pool, a little calendar by your day and see what day he signs. I actually do think that given his um, love of avoiding attention and the press, that he is going to pick like a, a Friday night PR burial. That's what MLB used to do when I was there. Like you announce like a suspension. Friday, 5 o'clock, baby. Hit that one, weekend. Nobody has their talk shows over the weekend, the whole deal. Friday night sounds like a great time. 1 o'clock on a Sunday. He's going he's gonna to be like, ah, the NFL, mm. they take up a lot of time. I'll announce it at 12.58 on a Sunday. There's a lot of people, though, conversing, watching sports during that time, drinking. You know what I'm saying? So, so maybe it'll get too much? My, my suggestion, I'll text him back, is to stick with the Friday plan, Okay. Let the weekend kind of simmer down, and then the talk shows resume on Monday. So okay. um, before we charge the mound, one other thing, because I'm going to mention this a little more frequently during this week. Uh, if you're listening to us on the pod, then check us out on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button, obviously, always free, and the like button to the show that you're watching. We appreciate you. And then vice versa, if you're watching us, you can also take us on the go, podcast uh, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your pods, the whole deal. All right, let's charge the damn mound because we do have a trade like Kip mentioned. And it occurred basically when everyone was arriving, the front office people in Nashville and Alex Anthopoulos, who definitely likes to get his work done early in the off season, is at it again. They needed a left fielder. They spoke about how Von Grissom is going to be a part of that mix. So is Jared Kelnick. So Ken Rosenthal was first to break the news. And then Ryan Divish actually provided the rest of the names, but Ken said last night at 1044 that the Braves picked up Jared Kelnick from the Mariners, and then the rest of the deal is as followed, as follows. 
Marco Gonzalez also moves to the Atlanta Braves. Evan White goes to Atlanta, whose name has popped up more in the last week than it had in like the last two years, just because he signed one of those early contracts, which is what we saw from Jackson Churio recently. Um, and then going the other way, Jackson Coar, who was just acquired by the Braves in the Kansas City deal for Kyle Wright, and also um, Cole Phillips, who hasn't pitched in the pros yet. Some say would have been a first-round pick, ended up being a second-round pick, big fastball, but Tommy John surgery, so he's still coming back. Mariners gave a little bit of money. We don't know what the amount is, probably not much, since they are super, super, super poor and lost all their money from this past season. They put it all in a piggy bank. They have no idea where it is. We'll talk to Ryan Divish about that part coming up on the Seattle side. Let's talk Atlanta for a sec, Kip. Basically, the Braves said we'd like some left field help and a starting pitcher. And here they go again, getting aggressive for a dude that's still only 24 years old. Anthropolis likes to work, like you said, early in the offseason. He likes to work early in guys' careers to give extensions. He likes just getting his stuff done early. And I think this is going to work out so well for the Braves with Kalenic. I think you – Instead of being kind of the middle focus of a lineup, he gets to go to an Atlanta lineup where the pressure's not on him. The pressure is he's going to be probably down in the six hole, seven hole. Uh, he's not required to be that big bat in the middle a little bit. I think he's going to be able to be comfortable. I think he's going to be around some great hitters that are going to uh, take the pressure off of him. And I think that's just going to allow him to become the better version of himself. And you saw glimpses of it last year when he's hot. He's, he's an impact bat. And so, I mean, just the Braves are doing it again. Yeah, and also, Kratz, I'll mention that Marco Gonzalez is not going to stick around with the Mariners, or excuse me, with the Braves for long. Uh, Ken has already said today that he's going to be part of another deal. So he's going to be on his way out somewhere else. And if you look at Atlanta, they're looking more for a top-end starting pitcher um, to bring to the mix for them. They've already gotten rid of quite a bit of depth, including guys like Soroka and uh, Schuster in the trades with the uh, Chicago White Sox. So there you go. There's the tweet right next to us. Braves do not Kyle plan Wright on keeping Marco. Kyle writes with Kansas City. Yeah. Okay. And probably not going to pitch this coming season anyway, but still under team control yeah. through 2026. So the Braves did some reshuffling and now, yeah, a guy like Kelnick. What do you think, Kratz? Did the uh, New York Mets finally say that they can win the uh, Edwin Diaz? Robinson Cano trade from years I back when Brody Van Wagner got smashed by some people, but actually they got a top tier closer for years. I think they finally can say they want it. I mean, this is this is this is just the Braves. It's funny how like things shift to like the narrative, but like I feel like we we create these narratives for teams, Rays pitching, you know. Yankees, not sure what they're going to do in the offseason, but, you know, they're a playoff team. The Red Sox, up and down narrative. The Braves, you sit here and you go, oh, man, Kelnick's like, this could be a huge breakout guy. Just like what Kip said, he's going to come in and give them, give them an opportunity to platoon a guy. Anytime you have a guy that really is red hot for one month and then – struggles after that which I would say that struggles afterwards like yes he broke his foot later on he didn't play through a broken foot he broke his foot kicking a cooler Kip will tell you everybody struggles at some point in the season you need to have the whole season to be able to turn it around you need to make the adjustment back he was on an all-star pace in that first month month and a half when he was absolutely raking and he was talking about his swing change and everything well, with a swing change, now people see new holes that they can exploit up in the zone, down and away, breaking balls, whatever it is. But you look at the Braves and you say, man, this narrative is just, oh, great. Another guy that they got. I don't think anybody's sitting there like, wow, that was really nice of them for picking up all that money. They're like, eh, roll the dice. See what happens. We're going to go ahead and pick this guy up. And we know what locked him in in the first month and a half. We're going to put him in situations to succeed because we don't just play one straight left fielder. But you know what? If he does pump some lefties too, then we can keep him out there. And, oh, by the way, he's 24 years old. So our, our organization actually got younger adding this guy. Yeah, this is a player who's not a free agent until after the 2028 season. I, I could definitely tell you about having a hot month and then struggling in some other months. 
um, that, yeah, go look at the back of my baseball card if they want to break it down by months. That's uh, kind of what happened in my career. But I think going to a team like the Braves, what hides it and what helped me too is when you're on a winning team, hmm. that hides some of your offers. You don't, you don't go home and you're not distraught over it. You're not hanging your head when you still beat a team, boat raced them 11 to 4, uh, <laughs> which the Braves will do. So he gets to have a better kind of a uh, more optimistic time showing up to the field every day. He's not hanging his head on every offer that happens throughout a game and he's gets to play part of that lineup. So I think this really is a perfect spot for him to kind of take off. Yeah. And for Kalanick, I mean, if he somehow struggles in the beginning of the year with this ball club, Alex Anthopoulos, I heard on an interview yesterday said they're super high on Vaughn Grissom. I still think there's a chance he's saying that because Vaughn could be some of their best trade bait too, but he dropped two comps for Vaughn yesterday because he's like, hey, of course, but he went, he went all in, ready? So he said, this hitter is like DJ LeMayhew, Howie Kendrick status. Thousand OPS guy in AAA. He said it. I heard the interview, okay? About Vaughn Gris- Grissom. About Vaughn Grissom. Grissom. Okay. Yeah. So he's like, dude, we're done with Vaughn in the minors. He needs to be up in the show. Obviously, he hasn't really had a spot for Atlanta. That's what happens, too, sometimes. You play for a team like Atlanta, especially, more than any other ball club right now. They have dudes locked in for a long time, and they play every day. So if you're trying to emerge as a ball player, and especially if you struggle for a pinch, they just won't deal with that. So it might be that he ends up with another ball club. I'm not sure yet what the approach is. Also, you do need depth, and he can play in the infield, and he's learning outfields more so in the offseason right now, too. I think he's playing in Puerto Rico winter ball right now. So something to keep an eye on with Atlanta. They know what they're doing, obviously. One more thing. I just want to show this tweet from uh, Jake Mastriani. I think I got it right here. Fangraph's roster resource has the Braves luxury tax payroll at $260 million. Assuming they don't want to go more than $40 million over the luxury tax number, which is like a salary cap basically in baseball, that leaves about $17 million for Atlanta. It really limits them to trade possibilities. Cease would still very much work. Of course, who knows what Alex Anthopoulos has planned. I, I just, I hate that we talk about this like it's a cap. Also, if teams go over a certain mark, Kip, like you pay a tax, it's not a crazy tax. We'll get to the Angels later. Like they do end up getting a, a draft pick out of losing Shohei and that helps. But if they actually went over, like, say, the Angels by a million bucks, you pay, like, 20%. So it's like, ooh, they ended up having to pay two hundred grand, which in baseball is like a quarter. Oh, they don't want to go over. They will. They will if the right player comes to them. Mm-hmm. That's, that's Yeah, any team who's – no team wants to go over. But find me a team, especially in the situation that the Braves are in a, with their window, they're going to go over. Or they're going to be susceptible to go over. They're going to be okay with going over if – player A comes into their lap and then will accept it. It's all, it's not, it's not a cap as much as, yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. So I would just keep that in mind. Like, I don't, I don't want people to read something like that, Kratz, and think, oh, well, Atlanta can't play for, I don't know, a Jordan Montgomery. Cause clearly they were in on Nola and, and Anthopolis kind of indicated that too, that they were, they were in on him. There were some reports that they were in on Sonny Gray. It seemed like they kind of shot that down, but, they were in on a big, big starting pitcher, and the one who got big money so far this offseason is Nola. So if they were in on Nola, I got to assume that they're still playing at the top of the market for a starter if the right fit is there. Plus, not to mention, J.P. Morosi said that the Braves are still talking to Shohei Otani's camp, <laughs> which is a whole nother ball game because that's $50 million probably per season. So I wouldn't worry too much about the Braves' finances. Agreed? I want to sign him on a one-year deal so he could prove his worth. One year, two hundred million dollars. <laughs> one one year, eighty. I think would do it. One do year, you? eighty. That's actually a great question. How much money? If you're in Shohei's camp, how much money does it take on a one year deal for you to take the deal versus what you'd get over? Let's say let's say ten years, five fifty is what's going to happen. What would convince you to do one year, knowing that you might be able to? Obviously, you're betting on yourself, but prove that. By the next year, you're healthy. Maybe you're throwing a little bit. Teams can see that, and you can sign as a, a true two-way player, again, as opposed to one that's supposed to come back. What's the number? They're, they're still going to worry. I mean, I say 80. They're still going to worry about the second Tommy John. Are you going to be able to pitch during the entire life of the contract? 
I don't think his values. I don't think his value is any different. But I'm gonna say I'm gonna say 81 and a half is the over under set at. Where's that one and a half come from? I don't know. It just sounded cooler. <laughs> He's an over under guy, so it's gotta be high because you're yeah you're if you're going off just bat alone, which is what it will be this next year. Uh, you're coming off one of his best offensive seasons there is. So you're already trying to sell high on that season. So you're basically having to do it all over again. Um, yeah, you're up near Kratz's number, I think. Okay. So uh, let's hit a poll. What's up? It's a fun hypothetical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what that one year? No, obviously, he's going to sign for 10 plus. Uh, the question um, at watchstadium.com slash foul territory is about the Blue Jays, which we'll get to later, as Ken wrote about them as well. They're going after Otani and Soto. Not going to get both, but pursuing both. Do you think, A, they get Otani, B, they get Soto, or C, they miss both? Watchstadium.com slash foul territory. The Mariners portion of this trade with Ryan Divish next. The Mariners are broke. Right. Jeff Passan reported that today, and obviously he's a great reporter. I have not heard that myself. I will believe any team is out or I will not believe any team is fully out until he signs. And that's just the nature of free agency. We get surprised all the time. Not saying Jeff is wrong by any stretch of the imagination, but things do happen. And the Mets, it's not a natural fit necessarily, but for a team that claims to be building for 2025 and beyond, it does make some sense because he will start pitching again, Mm -hmm. hopefully in 2025. And also, as I wrote today, Steve Cohen's trying to develop this entertainment megaplex at the site of City Field right next to it. All of these things kind of work hand in hand, the business and the baseball. So I would imagine that they're at least exploring it or have at least explored it. Maybe they're on to other things. Maybe their sole focus is Yamamoto. They certainly want him. He certainly fits as well because of his youth with their rebuilding plans or building plans, I should say, going forward. The Yankees... I'm not sure why they wouldn't be all out for this guy. He would be a monster in that stadium. But at the same time, they could trade for Juan Soto. They can sign another pitcher. They can do some things otherwise to address their outfield in particular that they feel or may feel is more important to them. The Yankees are an interesting operation right now. We don't know what they're going to do. It seems that they should be poised to spend and spend big. But they do have some big commitments on the books already. And Hal Steinbrenner has not been someone who has spent freely over the years. They've spent selectively. They've spent on Garrett Cole. They acquired Giancarlo Stanton. They gave Judge the big deal. Are they going to have a big offseason the way they did in 2009, 2013? Remains to be seen. And now back to foul territory. All right, so we covered basically every slice of the Braves portion of this trade of Kellenic over to Atlanta. Now our friend Ryan Divish joining us during an important time in the baseball world, writer for the Seattle Times. You can follow him at Ryan Divish. Ryan, great to see you. So I'm going to start out hot, okay? So my okay. question is, it's a two-parter. Number one, are the Seattle Mariners broke? Number two, if you ran a poll right now on your Twitter and said, who do you want as your GM starting today, Jerry Depoto or Cal Raleigh? How much would the vote be tilted to Cal? Okay. Um, <laughs> first of all, they are not broke. They they <laughs> cannot be broke. That's absurd. Anything that they say is broke. Um, obviously, it, what the poll would be, I could insert the joke that everybody's used on Twitter. It, it would be more than 54% would want Cal to be the GM <laughs> than Jerry. Um, it's amazing that that number, it, it's just not going away. That, that 54% thing, like it just has stuck. And, you know, like I wrote one day, I go the first or the next good joke I hear about 54% will be the first good one, but it has not gone away. It's just going to follow Jerry until they do something different. And it, what was crazy is if he, I think Codify put out the statistics over the 2000s or whatever. The Mariners won like 54% of their games. So it was just, it was kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, no, the first question, they're not broke. I think they're concerned financially um, for certain reasons, dealing with their their RSN, but they're not broke. I, no, you know what? No major league owner is broke. I, you know, I mean, if, if they want to see broke, I, I can show them my bank statements and I can show you broke. <laughs> 
they, they need a barometer is what you're saying. They need, yeah, yeah. They need you, you, you need to trade Jared Kelnick and Marco Gonzalez and Evan white. They yeah. don't need I mean, to trade like, them for nothing. Well, it's like, it's like, it reminds me of like the broke scale of if you have money or not, it's like the crazy hot scale. Well, if you're really, how much money do you have versus how much money do other people have? That kind of thing. But they're not broke. I mean, they had 2.8 million fans this year. Uh, two, that is the most fans they've had since 2005. I mean, the last, I think, 10 games or 15 games at T-Mobile Park were all over 30,000 people. And, you know, they had the All-Star game, which, you know, they don't get all the revenues for. But, like, they bought a building across the street from T-Mobile Park. It used to be the old Pyramid Brewing. They turned it into their own, like, bar and brewery and everything like that. That place is packed. And that money is not revenue shared with with other teams. You know, they they own that. Like they, like the, this is a team that knows how to make money. I mean, back in the day with Kevin Mather, uh, you know, before he went all crazy on Zoom, they made money when they didn't put out a very good product, and they weren't winning. They still made money. They were still not. They were still financially viable. Well, now they put out a pretty good product the last couple of years, and they brought fans in. You know, they're you know you've got a superstar where all their their revenues are up in jersey sales and all this other stuff. They're not poor, but they're they're concerned about their their network right now. I think is at least the kind of the rumblings I'm hearing. What's the end game here? Is is the end game because Jerry Depoto is going to get on the stand at some point and be like, you know what, you know we're really pushing, we're shifting pieces around. Do you believe he, as a GM, because I'm not going to touch the ownership and like directives for money right now. Do you feel like he, as a GM? With these moves and what could happen and what he said, wants to win a World Series. Yeah, I think he wants to win one. I just don't know that he has everything in front of him to do it, whether it's the payroll or, you know, obviously it's the payroll. It's like, so when he got hired in 15, um, they had this team, you know, that had Felix and, and Nelson Cruz, Robinson Cano, Kyle Seeger, Hasashi Okuma. I think those guys in like, guaranteed dollars was like over a quarter of a billion, like 250 million with all those guys added up. And so he gets there and their payroll is pretty high. It's in the one seventies or whatever. And they said, look, we want you to, you know, here's this team and it's old. We want you to try and win with it, but we don't want you to spend any money. So like they go out and what he does is you do a bunch of lateral moves, trying to like free up money, trying to make your team more athletic. I think that you're, you know, they, go out and get Leonis Martin and all these kind of fringy moves of a team that doesn't have a ton of flexibility and, and they try to win. It didn't work, you know, and then like even in the years ahead, I think it was 16 or maybe it was 18, they have a pretty decent team. They're in it. They're trying to hold off the A's. I think it was the one year and they get to the deadline and ownership says, well, like, look, you, we want you to make this team better and try and push to end this drought. Well, we don't want you to add payroll. And that was the year, I think, one of the years where they added, like, Zach Duke and Adam Warren and Cameron Maven. Well, that, I mean, like, those are kind of just, like, maybe you're, you know, like, a half win better. You know what I mean? Like, does it really make you that much better? Marginally, it makes you better. So, like, what he's having to do now is try to make this team better but operate in the margins of payroll or create fl payroll flexibility, um, which, God, you know, like, Nobody wants to hear that. No fans want to hear the words payroll flexibility. Um, but that's where he's at. I, I think he wants to win. I don't know. And I think, honestly, the Mariners' ownership wants to win. Like what we've said before, they just they don't like to take the risk factor in, in doing what it takes to win. Well, you kind of just said it. They, they take a lot of lateral moves, but they're creating this payroll flexibility. Uh, with the trade, they, got just, they dumped a little bit with clinic. They're going to have to pay him eventually or something like that. So they save some money. What moves do you see are going to be on the horizon for them then? Are they actually in play for some of the bigger names? Or what names are you kind of going to be hinting at to see them go for here? Yeah, I mean, like, so they with the Suarez trade, they saved about, I think, $7 million maybe. And then with this trade, uh, Evan White was owed about $17 million if you count the buyout over the next couple of years. And Barco was owed thirteen. million. They sent $4.5 million to the Braves, or they will send $4.5 million. So I think they, they, saved, they shaved about $24.5 million off their payroll for the next two seasons. I mean, it's not insignificant, but, again, like, they can afford it too. Um, yeah, they need a, they need an outfielder. They need a they would prefer a right-handed hitting outfielder or right-handed hitting bat. I mean, like obviously, you know, 
they've been linked to the Rays because they Depoto's made like a hundred trades with them. You know, like Isaac Paredes and 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 Randy Arozarena, they fit. I mean, Arozarena is going to get real expensive here in the next two years, but like they need it, they would prefer to have a right-handed hitting outfielder uh, to kind of fill that role. Right now, you're looking at it's Julio and Dominic Canzone and I don't know who else, you know, to play the outfield. You know, Kelnick was going to have one of those spots. I mean, like right now they have Luis Urias as their everyday third baseman. So they need multiple bats. You know, this is the division. It's got the Astros and the Rangers. In it. If the Rangers did nothing this season, this offseason to add, they're still significantly better than the Mariners right now. So, like, they got to do something. Like, is it going to be trading Bryce Miller, Brian Wu? Yeah, maybe. But then they just also gave up one of their depth arms in Marco Gonzalez. So, I think like you know, they're going to be looking at hard at the outfield, but I don't, you know, I don't think they're going to be in on Bellinger or Otani, and I don't think they have the stomach to do a, a Juan Soto trade. I mean, give up prospects plus thirty million dollars—that doesn't seem like them either. Which is crazy to think about this because their payroll is not off the charts. It's not touching what it used to be all of those years back, right? Where the game's mm-hmm. revenues have continued to go up, their attendance is better. Theoretically, they should be making more money at this point. So we're scratching off Otani. You're right. We're scratching off Soto most likely because he's going to make 30 something million dollars in his final season. So that's why you're down to a team like the Rays and two names that are brought up in Randy Rosarena and Isak Paredes, who are good names that would definitely help fill two gaps that they currently have in their lineup. I want to read you this um, little note from our friend Ken Rosenthal, who just wrote about the aftermath of the trade. And just let me know if this makes your blood boil. Um, covering this ball club. Earlier this offseason, the M's inquired, acquired about uh, Arozarena and Paredes, according to sources briefed on the discussions. At the time, they were not positioned to advance those conversations, citing financial restraints. Perhaps those talks can accelerate. Now, I want to point out, Arozarena is due to make $9 million next year, and Paredes is due to make $3 million next year. Is this where we're at with Seattle, where we're nickel and diming and putting them in like the 20th range for payroll as a small market ball club now? Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy to think that way. Um, I mentioned it. So, what, like, they're, they're internally, if I, people tell me, is they're very, uh, they're very kind of hesitant about their, their regional sports network, Root Sports Northwest. They own the majority share, which you would think would make them a little bit more bulletproof compared to like what's happening with Bally Sports. But what happened was, is Comcast Xfinity, the the largest provider in the in the Pacific Northwest, they took they're taking Root Sports off the basic tier, the basic package where anybody could get it, and they're putting it on their ultimate sports tier or whatever. And so, a fan that wants to have Root Sports is going to have to pay, I think it's like eighteen fifty a month to keep it. And you know that's oh, there are a lot of fans that just okay, that's it. And I think the Mariners invested in some some TV deals with the Seattle Kraken and the Trailblazers based on the idea that they were going to be on the basic cable package. So you're, you're paying this money to, to, to broadcast these games thinking you're going to get the revenues that you don't have to revenue share from non-major league baseball related sports. But if you lose 25% of your subscribers because of this, this jump up, I mean, that, that does hit you pretty hard financially, but yeah, it's still crazy to think that like, Oh yeah, they're, they got to start penny pinching, especially when their projected budget was never going to, their projected payroll is like 140. I mean, the, the league average is like 165. Now they're way down. And they're, they're, they're very, you know, like they're very aware. Logan Gilbert, George Kirby, and Cal Raleigh are going to get real expensive in arbitration over the next few years. I mean, honestly, if they're where they're at right now on the payroll, I don't, I don't expect to see, but maybe one of those guys stick around. You know, Logan will be, you know, Logan's got high value. Cal's going to have high value. Probably neither of those guys are going to resign anyway. So, you know, two years from now, you could see both those guys getting moved, you know, um, in trades because you know, Logan Logan will be tracking. He'll have four years of arbitration eligibility by that last year. If he hasn't signed an extension, it could be $17 million a year. You know, it's like on that. He could be on, you know, while he wasn't, isn't as dominant, he makes every start in the way arbitration works. He could be on that similar Walker Bueller path or Framber Valdez where they get real expensive in that third and fourth year of arbitration. I'm just wondering what this tells your fan base, though, as a Mariners organization. The last however many years, you've, you've, you're in the middle of a playoff run, you trade your closers, or you, you finally make it back to the playoffs and you start 
cutting cost here. It's like you every time you guys get close and you've been searching for the playoffs, you get there, you get close and all that stuff. And it's like two steps forward, one step back. It's like you're never really going for it. So if it just you're telling a fan base you're never going for it pretty much or you're never going to yeah. afford to get that big splash. The words always are going to be hollow. I mean, like, yeah. yeah, they ended the playoff drought last year, but where do they go from there? You know, like, yeah, it's great. You ended the playoff drought. You have this window. Like, I mean, like, they have a starting rotation that features Luis Castillo, George Kirby, Logan Gilbert. You have two young kids, Bryce Miller and Brian Wu, that were really good. You have Robbie Ray coming back. I mean, that's as good of a rotation as you're going to have in baseball. And it's a selling point. But, like, what are they going to do with it? The window, you know, the window of a pitcher's health all at the same time is pretty finite anyways. So it's like, where are you going to go? You got this close. You asked fans to believe in a rebuild that they started in 2019. And they, they always promise like once they, they, they tore it down and they're going to build it back up, they're going to go for it. Well, you know, like this is the time and it's kind of crazy too. A lot of the pieces of that rebuild are gone. You know, Jerry Kelnick gone now, Kyle Lewis gone, like all the pieces that the foundational pieces that they were going to build around. It's basically Julio, JP and Cal. And that's it. I mean, that's that's their core. Like if you we had, we were playing this game the other night, if you look around at the teams in the AL West or whatever, especially the good teams or the good playoff teams in baseball, how many of their guys can you would start for other teams? You know, Julio, obviously, Cal, probably for most of them, JP for teams that don't have Corey Seager. But the rest of their team is all kind of like, you know, replacement level guys and they need them, you know, and they remove guys that that have been above replacement level and where do they go? Because their upper levels of their franchise aren't very good either. Yeah. It's crazy, dude. That's what we've been talking about. There's three players out of nine in a lineup that are first division players on a, you know, team that should be in the postseason. That's a problem. And especially when the team's acting broke right now. And I also want to point out that even your mindset has to change as a writer covering this team. You're telling me Logan Gilbert could get expensive by the end of his uh, arbitration years from now at 17 million. That's basically what Kyle Gibson and Lance Lynn and some mm-hmm. of these guys, and even Luis Severino, that's like pretty close to what those guys just signed for in the off season. If you think about it, and Gilbert's like an, upper rotation guy and these are five starters on the free agent market just crazy to think about that so I want to finish with this on the pitching front for you just because we didn't get to the other side of it um, thoughts on the return there and what you've heard I mean Coar has now bounced around a couple teams here in the last couple weeks used to be a big deal prospect and Cole Phillips nothing against him he just had Tommy John surgery and has a big arm so more arms for the Mariners yeah like I, I mean I guess like know what you're good at I mean like Coar, you know, they, they look at him and I mean, like you look at some of his pitch profiles and stuff like that. And like if, if they turn him into, you know, if they keep him as a reliever and they, they turn him into Justin, Justin Topo or some of these guys that are really valuable and you get two or three years. I mean, like, I don't think he's going to be Andres Munoz. You know, that's kind of what they're hoping with the trade from the Diamondbacks is the kid they got from the Diamondbacks make make him into the next Munoz. But they believe in their pitching stuff and they've been really good at it. I mean, they pick up pitchers and they make them into something. But yeah, and, and Cole Phillips is a lottery ticket at this point. Yeah, it's, it's great. He's a lot really talented, but he's 20, hasn't thrown a big league – or hasn't thrown a professional pitch. So I guess, you know, play to your strengths. I mean, that's the one thing. Like, they can attract pitchers. You know, we talked about them trying to get Blake Snell or whatever. They can get pitchers, and pitchers want to come to Seattle because they get better. It's just how do you do stuff to get better on the position player side, and we haven't seen it yet. And I just don't know that, like – there's not a free agent market that really gets them better and they'll have to do a trade, you know, and, and, you know, that means you're giving up pieces as well. So I, I mean, I suspect they'll trade one of the young arms here in the, in the coming weeks for a player. And, and then, you know, they'll put piece together an offense that still won't be commensurate to what they need to be, to be good in the, in the future. Well, Ryan, we appreciate the time. We, seem to be having an increasing number of Mariners fans following our show. So this was, I think, much needed therapy because I think this is the third time you've been on the show. And the first two times we're we're talking like, hey, what could Otani look like here? And now we're like, can they afford a Rosarena and Paredes? Yeah, it's it's like Mariners fans right now. It's like Lord of the Flies right now. People are just going insane. As they should, dude, as they should. So hopefully we have you back on for something positive. Um, enjoy the meetings in the meantime, at least get some good food and some cocktails when you're done for the day. And we'll talk to you soon, dude. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever been to this place. It's the seventh Mm -hmm. circle of hell. 
is not your this is not your area. I, I saw I saw where you're at, mm. and I'm like, you need some mm -mm. trees behind you. There's some. Oh, this is it's there's just some trees out there. You, find them. Yeah, it's not where you want to be. It looks like Christmas threw up in here. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect description of why we're not there, Ryan. Cheers. We'll talk Thank to you, you soon, there. dude. Be Thank nice. you. Ryan Divish, you can follow him at Ryan Divish, and we'll post some of these clips coming up in just a sec. We'll be right back. But I also look at the positive end of, hey, this team's gone through some losing that you guys want to wash away, and who's the next guy that's going to take over the clubhouse, make people feel good, right, make people feel comfortable? Do, right. do you have anyone in mind or maybe multiple people that can do that. And have you had conversations with those people about how it's going to change with someone like that leaving? Yeah. Make the makeup of the clubhouse is completely different. Cause like we can't say this about too many players, but for the last like two decades, this guy has governed this clubhouse and, and being that presence and being the, the go-to guy. And he, he, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't openly talk about is how, how great players or big names shield the clubhouse from virtually everything, like no matter what's going on, like everybody check Miggy's mood, everybody check Miggy if he's in the lineup and where his performance is, whether you're on a good team or on a mediocre team, it kind of shifted all attention to Miguel. And then last year, every stop along the way, we got gifts, you know, from, for Miggy and there was a presentation and, and there was a, um, some of them better than others, but it was fun to, to celebrate him all year. Well, that takes a ton of pressure off everybody and now that's gone so we're going to embrace it the fact that we need to develop our own identity um not really because i think i think when players put you know clauses in contracts like that they're there for a reason and players can exercise them whenever those situations come up and i you know i think every player should stand up for themselves i think every player should get what they you know what they ultimately want and i think players should play where they want to play Sometimes you have to, that not all those things combine, right? Sometimes you don't get the most money in the place you want to play. So you have a real dilemma on your hands. Other times it works out perfectly. So um, I was close with Eduardo. I'll stay close with Eduardo. We went through a lot of life things together. And, I, you know, I was just a sounding board for him. As a manager, I get close to my players. I, I'm, I'm there for him. He confided a lot of stuff in me. So I, I know a lot about what makes him tick and why, you know, why he's doing what he's doing and, um, even all the way to the finish line, like he was very open with me on, on what he was hoping going to happen. And then ultimately he opted out. And now back to foul territory. Back on stadium with Russ Dorsey, Bron Kipnis and Kratz winter meetings time. And Russ, let's get right into the poll question. We'll dive into it uh, on the Blue Jays. So there's been a lot of writing and speculation that they might do something big, or at least they're going to try. So we put the poll out. Will they get Otani, get Soto, or miss both? I just voted. I actually put Soto. I think they have a shot. And if the Yankees don't pay up the way the Padres want them to, or maybe they don't match up that way, I think Ricky Tiedemann's a really good pitching prospect who they can revolve this deal around. And that might be the best prospect they could get in a deal like this quality wise maybe they do get him because i don't think they're getting their time your thoughts i'm just speculating I, the the one that they need to me is soto because i think when you look at the toronto blue Jays and their offensive production you know what you're gonna get out of springer most times you know what you're gonna get about vlad jr like when he's playing at the vlad jr level bobachette etc but you look at their outfield right outside of springer and if he gets banged up, then you just have to worry about Dalton Barsha, who is an elite glove, but didn't really show the offensive upside that he did his last year in Arizona. So I think they need Juan Soto. And you look at that production, and I love the idea of Toronto saying, hey, we're going all in with Blatty, with Bo Bichette. Who knows what happens with Matt Chapman, but we're going to have our lineup revolve around Juan Soto and Blatty. Isn't Vladdy essentially what – isn't Vladdy supposed to be what Juan Soto has been his entire career? Like, Vladdy's not MVP season. Like, it's more walks than strikeouts. It's been – so shouldn't Vladdy be the guy? Like, if they just say, hey, you know what, we're not picking Soto up because you need to be our Juan Soto, wouldn't it be better if they got somebody else? 
Not necessarily. I because I, I look at it as why not have two of those guys, right? Like why mm-hmm. not have a guy in Juan Soto from the left side, have Vladdy from the right side, and I think you're right. You look at that 2021 season that Vladdy had, where in a world where Shohei doesn't exist, he's the runaway MVP in the American League. I think he's closer to being that player than the player we've seen over the last year and a half that wasn't really producing, wasn't really hitting the ball in the ballpark last year until the back half of the season. I think he's closer to being the AL MVP uh, runner-up from 2021. But you still need uh, other guys in that lineup that can help a guy like a Vlad Jr., right? Having Juan Soto in that same lineup helps Vlad Jr., right? It helps Bo Bissett. It helps David Schneider. It helps George Springer. So I – I would love that move just from a baseball standpoint and saying, all right, you run that one through five in that order against anybody else in baseball, you're going to have a tough go. If they add, if they add Soto or Shohei, are they now the American league favorite for the world series with their starting, with their starting rotation, four guys that made over 28 starts, like possibly one of the most solid rotations not the most like elite top end but their ceiling their their floor is like here so do they become do they catapult to the number one contender in the american league with either one of those guys i'm trying to quickly run through the team so al central they got everybody in that division uh the al east are they better than the yankees with juan soto Maybe because of the starting pitcher, right? They're better than Boston if they do that. I think you look at the AL West. All right, wait a minute. Let me go back to the AL East. Are they better than the Orioles if they add Juan Soto? That's that's my question. I that's that's I, is that I lineup is to... that lineup what it should be? Because this year's lineup was supposed to be absolute gas. They were supposed mm-hmm. to mash, and it was kind of flipped upside down. The starting pitching kind of did it, and they kind of hit some. I think that's the thing I'm concerned about with Baltimore in that whole equation where I think the O's are going to hit, right? And, and especially if Jackson Holiday comes up and plays for them majority of next season. I really like that team. I really like that lineup. But I don't know if they can match the starting pitching that the Blue Jays have with Kevin Gosman at the front end. Are they the? I have a, t- a tough time saying they'd be the best team in the American League, though just because those teams in the AL West have been so strong for so long. And I think you look at the Texas Rangers early in their tenure with Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon and not knowing what they do in the starting pitching market, where they can be in on a lot of guys too. I still like the the, the Rangers and what they can do. Even a team, the Rangers, the Rangers were a team that barely made the playoffs. Yeah, I know they won the world series, but Mm -hmm. they barely made the playoffs. So to me, then I'll double down since it's on me again. They had Shohei and Soto. Pipe no. dream. No. Pipe dream. Scott doesn't want to go there like, like we're talking about the NFL. <laughs> but we're talking about a team in the Blue Jays that owns an entire country. Do they become World Series favorites if they add them both? Well, yeah, at that point, if you're going to go all in okay, and good. screw it. <laughs> I'll be damned if there's a better team than us <laughs> this year. Yes, I think you can definitively say they would be the World Series favorite if they add both Shohei Otani and Juan Soto. Do they get that done? If they do, salute because that, that is uh, that's quite the haul there uh, at the winter meetings or in an off season. But I'd love to see the chaos that ensues after that. Uh shirtless show for you or whatever you want kratz something something to embarrass myself dinner whatever okay whatever you want you you name it we'll make it happen you gotta shave if... the beard and only go mustache done mustache for a week okay this is Two such weeks. an opposite conversation of the mariners one we just had yeah right? exactly right? exactly but still i'm telling you and this actually leads to my next question the Blue Jays are going after Otani, okay? If they don't get him, Soto is a great backup option for them, even though it's one season. I think it's a, a great situation for a team that, in my mind, has two years left in their winning window because I don't know if they're going to keep both Vladdy and Bo Bichette. And some of their other pitchers are getting older. Like, this is their time to win, and they have not done what they are supposed to do. They haven't won a playoff series since, what, 2016 or something. 
So with all of that being said, Russ, do you think that that scenario is going to make the winter meetings potentially boring in that there are other teams that are in the same boat too that are waiting for mysterious Shohei to make a decision? Now, I said that I think he'll make a decision by Friday, but that would be after the winter meetings. But Toronto might say to San Diego, hey, let's chill for a little bit because if we don't get Otani, we can probably give you a little more for Soto right now, but we can't do our Soto trade yet because we're not getting both. The Giants could make the same case with some of the other dudes that they might go after and on and on, right? Like the Giants probably not getting Bellinger, Otani, and someone like Montgomery or Yamamoto, but they'd like to get maybe get two of those guys. So with all of this being said, if Otani just kind of sits back and is still deciding, is that going to prevent serious big signings in this winter meetings? Likely. And I think when you look at what Shohei is as a free agent, he is the big domino. He is the big piece. He is the straw that serves the drink right now. And I think something you hear when you talk to people in the industry uh, is irons in the fire, right? A lot of teams have a lot of irons in the fire right now. But until people know what their resources are, what the market looks like without Shohei on it, I don't think a team like the Dodgers can decide, oh, are we still in on Yamamoto? Well, we, I want to know if we get Shohei first. And then we can be very confident in those conversations like, hey, we got Shohei. Let's go get uh, Yoshinobu Yamamoto as well. Like if, if you're a team that's in on Blake Snell, do you want to see if Yom- Yamamoto signs first? Well, does Yamamoto sign before Shohei? So like there's all these, you know, ups and downs of if this happened, this, then this happens. Like, you know, when you're a kid and you're reading uh, those books that says to find out what happens, turn to page 47. I think there are a lot of teams in that boat. Like, all right, if Shohei signs, turn to page 47, right? And then there's a lot of events that happen after that. Like, I think you go from Shohei to Yamamoto, Yamamoto to Snell, Snell to Dylan Cease getting traded, right? Like, I don't think a Dylan Cease trade happens before those other things happen, right? Like, so until we get Shohei to sign, especially in the starting pitching market, I think we have a tough time having more movement, maybe some lower level deals, but you're not going to see any of the big boys sign until Shohei moves, in my opinion. You kind of answered my question. That's where I was going with uh, who would they go after if they missed out on Shohei. It's always the big dominoes that have to go first because teams want to wait and see what what they can get in there, and then they'll put their money towards elsewhere. Um, Going back to Toronto, though, let's say, obviously, let's say Shohei signs elsewhere. Let's say they then, okay, they turn attention to Soto. Yankees can offer more money. What does Toronto look like? Where do they go then next? What does those next names look like? Because you said Snell yeah. sees for pitcher markets. What's the hitter market? I think, Kip, it's a, it's a tough year in the free agent market in terms of position player. Like, there's just not that top-end talent like we've seen over the last three or four years when you had names like Judge, Machado, Harper, uh, all the shortstops, whether it's Correa and Seager uh, and Simeon out there, it's just not that this year, right? And so you look at what Toronto needs. They need outfit. Where do you go? And something I tweeted as just an expectation I had before the winter meeting started is I think you have seen an increase in the trade market, at least talk in the trade market, because of the lack of production that is out there in the free agent market, especially in the outfield market where Toronto will be looking. So is there a name out there that could interest Toronto? I know a lot of teams are calling the Chicago White Sox. Like, could a guy like an Aloy Jimenez fit up north of the border in Toronto if you're looking for offense? Like, that, if I'm a team that needs offense and I look at a guy in Aloy, it's like, all right, it's a lot of homers out there. Maybe he doesn't play outfield full time. Maybe he DHs for us the majority of the time. But I think that's a guy that in Rogers Center hit a lot of home runs. So I, I definitely think as we go here and you're seeing some of the movement in the starting pitching market and free agency, I think on the other side of that, I think you're going to see more of that offense production. I think teams are going to really look heavily into the trade market this year. All right, Russ, enjoy yourself out there, man. Don't get lost. Yo, it's a big, it's a big place. I know Diver said it's the seven rings of hell. This place is massive, so I will likely get lost at least once or twice. <laughs> you, they need navigation on your phone to get everywhere within the hotel. I know that's not usually how it works, but they need it. They got maps everywhere, so they know people getting lost. 
I can't read a map. I only do straight up what the phone tells me to do. If it tells me to walk into the ocean and keep walking, I listen because I trust that eventually I'll get where I need to go. Uh, There was a time there was a time where you all you had was map quests. Like, don't do that. (laughs) Right. You you Yeah, and guess what? Russ, when I when I printed out map quests and then went to drive somewhere that was like beyond the 10, 15 minute radius of where I lived, I was so freaking lost I ended up in other states. And I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna (laughs) do this. So um, I'm thankful for the technology that we have now, dude. <laughs> Russ, find Russ, find a buddy. Yeah. Find a buddy that you're going to go to every press conference with, and if you don't see him or her, or she doesn't, or he doesn't see you, they'll raise their hand, and then we'll, we need to find our Russ. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pro buddy system. I'm pro buddy system. I got a, you got a lot of friends here. It's the great part about the winter meeting. So somebody is likely to say. I don't see Russ. Let's find him. And then there's a search party to find me at the winter meeting. Okay, perfect. So when we talk to you later this week, we'll find out who Russ's buddy is on the buddy system. Enjoy uh, life out there, dude. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Cheers. Stadium's Russ Dorsey with us. We'll be right back to look at the Angels getting under the luxury tax payroll. Thank God. And then... As Ken confirmed this morning, the report from Craig Mish, the Marlins are hiring former manager of the San Francisco Giants, Gabe Kapler, as their assistant general manager. The team was intrigued by his success in player development during his time as the farm director for the Los Angeles Dodgers. So, Kratz, Cap in Miami. It's like a match made in heaven. It's like, come on, he's going to love it. This, he's going to, he might not even show up. If he's if he's hanging out in Miami, he might not even show up at the field. He's just gonna be like, Jim Tan, done. Gonna be just, gonna Jim be, Tan and Marlin's laundry room, which has good Wi-Fi, which we learned. We that is that is tremendous. I love that. There, <laughs> there is there. I hate I hate to sit there and go, okay, like you got rid of Kimming and then you brought in Kapler. He's going to be the assistant GM, but he's going to be focusing on minor league stuff. Hmm. Like I, to me, <clears throat> to me, and and Skip has nothing to worry about. I just hope that they said, "Hey, you know what? This has nothing to do with you, Skip. We are not bringing in the future manager." Like something needs to be said. Oh, uh, because, really? Because, you think he's looking behind his back because Cap's there? I don't think Skip role? is. I don't think no. Skip is. But I think no, the respect it, it, factor because of the fact that. They did the same thing to Kim Ng, who was doing a great job. And they basically went behind her back and stabbed her in the back and was like, you did great. Let me take this knife out of your back because yeah. we're <coughs> getting somebody to be over top of you. It might just be the optics, and I might be looking out for my guy. No, you're 100% right. But something needs to be said because – that's bull if they're bringing in someone else. But hey, you know what? All the other twenty nine teams need I, to be like, need to be <laughs> like, hey, <laughs> we'll take Skip. I agree with you one hundred percent. I agree with you one hundred percent, dude. It's kind of, you know, it's an odd way of bringing somebody over. I, I, I don't know. I'm not saying I don't like it. I'm just saying it's, it's odd knowing he's a younger guy. He's been a manager, and you got Skip Schumacher there. He's coach of the year in the National League. So it's like, I don't, I don't understand. I just don't. I don't, I don't think I don't uh, think that's going to happen. No, I don't, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't think it is either. And now, back to foul territory. What's up? We're back. And a quick reminder that the fifteen hundred dollar first bet offer is on. If you use the bonus code foul f o u l, and you're new to the party at BetMGM, download the app on iOS, Android, or at BetMGM.com. You can sign up and deposit at least ten dollars into your new account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if the bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Poll results for fans thinking the Blue Jays will do something. Missing both is winning at the moment between Otani and Soto. I do want to mix in a question related to Shohei. One of our regulars in the FT chat, Armin, said, can you ask Russ if the Mets miss out on Yamamoto and he signs before Otani? Do the Mets go in on Otani? I think the Mets have been in on Otani. My understanding is that there are a number of teams that are going to pay in the five to six hundred million dollar range. At that point, for Shohei, he gets to decide 
which ball club he wants to go to, right? And I think some of those reports that have been out there that have said no on Mets, and really we haven't seen much on Yanks, obviously, either, Kip, I think it has to do with him not wanting to play in New York. I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, if he's getting 550-ish and he can be on the West Coast, which he's indicated last time that that was what he was into, why is he going to come to the East Coast also knowing the New York media is going to not accept no for an answer to him never talking, and they'll make it a thing. They'll make it a distraction around the team. If you're his teammate and he chooses only to talk every week and a half for five minutes, you're going to get the brunt of that. Every five seconds, a reporter's going to come up to you. Hey, what show are you doing? Why isn't he talking, right? The main reason he'd go to the East Coast would be because there's probably 600 million reasons to go to the East Coast. <laughs> That's going to be what draws him there. I understand that he doesn't want to go to New York media. That's actually a big thing amongst players. A lot of people don't want to do that. Uh, but money talks. Money talks more than Shohei talks right now. But he's going to he, – he deals with the media already. It's already a, like a bonanza everywhere he goes with uh, the media overseas and how many reporters follow him. Um, I think – whether he's kind of followed in line with uh, the kind of the trout stance, kind of he's quiet, he's soft-spoken, doesn't love the media side of that. Um, if that – that all goes to die, though, in New York. You can't, you can't run from that. You sneeze wrong, you're on the back page of the New York Times. <laughs> That's why I'm like, Kratz, do you see him ending up in the Northeast? Yeah, 600 million reasons why, I agree. But the San Francisco Giants and L.A. Dodgers can offer him 600 million, too. I think the Giants will overpay to drive up the price for the Dodgers. If if they don't succeed, they'll at least they'll at least drive the price up. And the Dodgers are saying, "Well, we really want him because we know how to use him." I think it's a West Coast thing. I, I don't see if we're getting to the East Coast, it would be Toronto. He would have that. He would have that idea of owning the country. Not, not for him. I don't know that he necessarily wants that. The team could sell it. But it would give it would give an opportunity for him to get that. They can pay, and he would be sheltered. It is very sheltered up there. Chris, would you agree with me that uh, like former players, a lot of guys have New York and Boston on their trade list? Hold Fun that. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Ryan Helsley on hour two. See you on Stadium. What's up? Second hour of FT Live, winter meetings week. Let's make things happen. If you missed anything on us breaking down the Jared Kelnick to the Atlanta Braves trade, plenty of it, okay? Just backtrack later on when we're done and check all of that out. Um, we're going to talk to Ryan Helsley, closer for the St. Louis Cardinals, in just a minute. Kip, you want to reiterate what you were asking Kratz before? I do. I was going to say I wanted to ask Kratz because I'm sure he's – when you play with guys and you talk to them about it when contracts come up, there's a no trade clause, especially the bigger players – uh, I think people would almost be surprised to find out how often you're going to have, and some fan bases and cities will be mad at me for saying this, where it's like, okay, sometimes Oakland's on there a lot, maybe a Detroit or weather or uh, a Cincinnati, especially if you're a pitcher, you don't want to play in these like ballparks where the ball flies out. And then you find out there's New York, especially the Yankees and Boston uh, are on a lot of players, no trade clauses because they just do not want to deal with the media there. 
If I think I'm fans would be surprised how often they are. Yeah. I mean, if I'm a teammate of somebody that doesn't want to go to New York just because the media is going to be tough on them, I think it might be tough in a lot of places, but I've seen it. I've yeah. I've seen it and for different reasons, but those are the places that pay the money. And those are the places that when you do well there, because every player, no matter where you're at, you want to shelter yourself into the mindset of I'm going to do as well as I can no matter where I am. That Those places will pay you better. They'll pay you better up front, and they'll pay you better after your contract if you do well in those cities. So I hear you, but I know like I know, the first contract that DJ LeMahieu signed, he had the exact same contract with the Rays, and he signed with the Yankees instead. It was like that two-year piece that he got before this recent like six-year, $90 million that he just got, and he chose, he chose New York over Tampa. They're high yeah. risk, high reward cities. Yep. Mm-hmm. Very much yeah, so. It worked and, out well and, for and DJ. DJ's, and DJ's a quiet guy. DJ's not like a media darling. And he doesn't he doesn't enjoy the media at all. But he wanted to go there for for the success of winning. Well, let's bring in our next guest on FT Live, one of our regulars, Ryan Helsley, uh, flamethrower on the St. Louis Cardinals, joining us right now. Oh, love the, hats. Uh, love the hat, too. <laughs> Winter hat gang. Yeah, a little, little cold up here. Got to stay warm. Yeah, but your there ears you aren't cold, I guess. Your ears aren't cold. It's just just the top of your head. Yeah, I got I got bed head, so I had to cover it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. the move. That's the most important that. thing. If the head is warm, heats the rest of the body. Ears are fine. So, Ryan, let's bring this combo right over to you. Um, when you play in New York, do you feel the difference after a game if there's something big that goes on? And what do you think about the difference between – playing in, say, a smaller or mid-market or a lighter media coverage market versus playing in a big spot, like Kip mentioned, that some players will say, hey, I don't want to go to New York or Boston just because I don't want to handle all of that. Yeah, I mean, it definitely plays a factor. You know, some guys, like you said, don't care as much and can handle the added extra pressure, you know, but other guys, you know, don't want that added pressure, you know, because that's something else you got to worry about and handle throughout the season. You know, I think a lot of guys – you know, just want to play play the game and go about their daily business and their routines and not really worry about the outside noise, but that's kind of part of the deal when you sign up for this thing. Yeah, good call. Uh, what do you think so far of the uh, hot stove season? How much are you paying attention to things, including what your team has done, which is quite a bit so far? Yeah, I've been watching a little bit. You know, I kind of expected us to have a big off season. You know, it kind of left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. Um, not quite used to having the season we did last year, but you know, you never know with professional sports, um, year in and year out. So, um, it's exciting though, you know, I had three guys who have had a lot of success in the big leagues and, you know, be leaders in our clubhouse now, you know, it'll be exciting to get down there. And, you know, from what I've seen, they're expected to do more. So, I mean, still working and still going, you know, so it should be an exciting rest of the off season. When you get three guys this early to add to your rotation, are you sitting there like, okay, well, let's. Let's see what else we can get. Let's let's scoop this guy up and let's scoop this guy up. Or is it, has it been boring the last like week and a half since they haven't signed anybody? No, no, not boring. I mean, I think uh, you know having those guys, like I said, is really exciting. And you know, coming to the off season, it's like we have such a big hole to fill. And you know, Sonny Gray, who's pitched great the last few years, and Kyle Gibson and Lance Lynn, you know, steady pieces in our rotation as well. It's going to be exciting. And you know, maybe we had some bullpen help and. You know, maybe another starter. I don't know. We got a lot of see a lot of stuff about there about trades, and you know, it's going to be exciting. That's for sure. You got any? You you've been a Cardinal for life. You got any buddies that are free agents or on the trade block that are out there right now? Um, I don't think so. I mean, all the guys I kind of grew up with are already on other teams, or you know, like Dakota Woodruff and or Woody Woodford and. Uh, Kisner grew up with them and then like Zach Gallon and Sandy, you know, pretty much everybody else is kind of stuck with their team, so to speak, right now. I don't think anybody's really made it to free agency yet. So Jordan Montgomery, he's a free agent. You're not are you giving him a call or are you like starting pitchers? Those are those guys don't really work every day like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that guy's got enough going on. He don't need to hear from me. I'm sure his phone's ringing off the hook with you know, his agent and other teams trying to talk to him. And obviously we'd love to have Jordan back. You know, he's a stud for the Rangers and pitch great for us. And, you know, it could be a horse for us too in the future. Um, so that, that'd be exciting if we get him back. That's what I mean. Like call these guys and be like, hey, look, this is what I'm going to do. 
Like, you come out, you come here, you sign, you get your millions, because we know the Cardinals have millions on millions on millions with the whole city that they have behind the stadium and fans are always coming out. Be like, you just you just get us through seven and I'll lock the rest down. For you. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe I need to start doing my part, my fair share. And yep. I need to look and see who's still on the market and tell them, hey, we got, got something good cooking over here in St. Louis. You know, we need That's what you got to do. Absolutely. Come, come guy. Hey, Ryan, did you see this coming from Monty? And when I say that, obviously you had him starting two years ago when you got him at the trade deadline, but then he starts out – this season with St. Louis pitched really well, goes to Texas, pitches even better, shows off on a national stage in the postseason. I'll go off. I'm, I'm into the numbers. I'll go off some, some reporters that were thrown out before the season started. Maybe he would get like a Taiwan Walker, Jamison Tyone type of contract, which is still great. I mean, those guys signed for like in the seventies, eighties million dollars. Okay. Um, like for example, I'm just looking these up on the fly here, four years, 72 for Taiwan Walker. Jordan's going to double that. So his value increased in one season by like a hundred percent. Did you see that coming? And if not, what led to that? Yeah, I think last year when he came over, you know, he pitched really well for us and, you know, not knowing him, obviously and getting to know him, it was really cool to see. And then started out pretty well this year, you know, it was one of our best pitchers. And then, you know, we struggled mightily throughout the whole season and obviously we had to trade him and then you know went to an even bigger market team you know than St. Louis they're in the playoff push and he pitches great and then you know you always hear guys say you got to have you know your best season at the right time and I think he did it you know like you said I think he's gonna make himself a lot of money he pitched great in the biggest moments you know and that's what teams want they want guys who've you know proven themselves and you know he's a six-year seven-year bet whatever he is now and you know, he's, he's going to earn every dollar that he gets. You know, he's pitched great and always been that steady guy and somebody can always count on. And that's what holds down your rotation for a full season and somebody, you know, you can depend on giving the ball to in any situation in the postseason. And he's going to demand top dollar and he deserves it. And then, you know, it's going to be fun to see his market shake out. What was he like as a teammate? Yes, yeah, awesome, super awesome guy. You know, some starters come in and, you know, they have their blinders on they don't talk to you all day and you know but him he'd sit with you and do a, a crossword puzzle or whatever in the lunchroom and just hang out and talk to you like a any old day you know he's just awesome guy and obviously I was never in the dugout when he was pitching but you know I'm sure when it was game time it was time to go you know you saw when he's out there on the mound he was competing and obviously his results back that up um but you know he's a great great teammate and obviously a guy who's very experienced and can help push any clubhouse to that next level Ryan, we saw that Yachty's back for you guys as kind of an advisor role. Uh, what are you guys going to try to get out of that, having him around the team still? Is he going to be helping with the catchers and pitchers and just kind of going through where he was before? What are you guys going to look to get out of him in that? Yeah, I think he'll help a lot. You know, I know Wilson looked up to him a lot, you know, and I think having, you know, Herrera now, who's played with Yachty a little bit, but I think it's going to be great for them to have, you know, an icon and a legend in St. Louis, especially, you know, one of the greatest catchers to be around and, you know, just pour into them, which is going to only help the pitching staff as well. And, you know, you played against them and I've heard a hitter say you can never really guess, so to speak, to how he's going to attack a hitter because he just kind of thinks outside the box and, um, you know, he's just so unique and he was really special and that he could slow the game down, you know, and maybe he can help, you know, our catchers do that too and just be able to see things that not everybody else is capable of doing. And, you know, just having a guy like that in the clubhouse who's won and who's been there and, you know, multiple All-Stars and Gold Gloves and things like that, you know, he's going to add tremendous value to us. Yeah, there is not there is no box when you're, Yachty was catching. I've never seen anybody steal more strikes for pitchers <laughs> than Yachty at that. And it's just like he literally you're, it almost hits the ground. He flips it right up, gets the call, and he just kind of like smiles at you. And you're like, there's nothing you can do about it the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the most annoying things ever. Thank God Kratz never was able to do it. I was actually way better than Yachty at it. That was the one thing I was good at. Yachty was just really good at tricking people into thinking that he knew what he was doing. He tricked people into thinking he was good. Got yep. it. For 20 years. He, when he, he, tricked them. He, trick. he tricked them the whole time. If he had gone to another team, he'd have been a backup, just like me. But <laughs> he, was, he was fine. That was going to be my question is, now it's actually official. Yachty and Wayno are out of there. 
who's going to be missed more? We asked Descalso this the other day. Who is going to be missed more? And you can have bias. Since you're a pitcher, you can have bias, but you just better choose correctly. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Miles probably kind of falls into that, being there for you know going on his sixth year now and a veteran guy who's pitched well for us the last few years. And, um, you know, obviously Lance Lynn being a former Cardinal and Kyle Gibson and Sonny Gray coming over to coming over and then, you know, having Wilson back there who's, you know, won a World Series and, you know, those guys just being the leaders of our clubhouse thing's going to be big and, you know, probably have to put some on my shoulders as well, you know, being out in the bullpen, got to lead a little bit more now, getting up there a little older. Um, I'm more of a quieter guy, don't, don't speak a whole lot, but maybe, you know, try to work on my speeches to help the bullpen guys a little bit and, you know, kind of help us find that extra gear, you know, because at some point in your career, you know, you got to try to help make the guys around you better. And, you know, your first few years, you're just trying to kind of blend in, so to speak, and kind of get your solid footing and um, not step on anybody's shoes. And, you know, now I think being where I'm at, you know, maybe trying to uptick a little bit and try to be a little more of a leader. Okay. That's who's going to be the leader. My question is, who is going to be missed the most? Yachty oh, or <laughs> missed the most? Yachty or Wayno? There's no right know. answer. But there's a wrong answer. Yeah, <laughs> correct. I I don't know, man. I mean, I don't I don't think you can go wrong saying either one. You know, when Wayno had his retirement ceremony this year on the field, I didn't even know Yachty was coming, and they announced that Yachty was there. And I'm it was like we hit a walk off homer in the World Series. You know, that place <laughs> that place freaked out when they heard Yachty and Molina and Pujols were walking out. It was gave me goosebumps sitting there. You know, it was absolutely insane. You know, I don't I don't know how you can pick either one of those guys. You know, I think. They both bring a lot of value and, you know, they're great friends and, you know, just awesome human beings. You have to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> and also, they're not your teammates anymore. So, yeah, like, yeah, they won't take it personal. And if anything, Wayno's probably going to do some media next year. So, I mean, if you struggle, he might talk shit. If you do well, he might praise <laughs> you. Just saying. Yachty might say yeah. it to your face, though. So, there's that, too. Yeah. He's got I mean, a neck I mean, tattoo. Young, He's got some you know, street cred. Probably a little closer with Wayno, uh, fantasy football, just off the field stuff, hanging out with him a little more than Yachty. Um, you know, just being able to call him probably more of a friend, you know, for being honest. Just obviously there's a language barrier with Yachty, but, you know, if I needed something, obviously Yachty would pick up the phone and help me out as well. But probably a little closer with Wayno, and, you know, he's a really good friend and, you know, someone who I'll definitely keep in touch with. 1-1. One, one. There you go. 1-1. One, one. one Yachty. De uh, Descalso, your new bench coach, if you're not sure who that guy is. Google him, but <laughs> one one. He picked Yachty, you picked Wayno. That's fine. We'll tell Yachty. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, good, sure. good luck. We'll get back to him. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, um, if you want to learn more about your new bench coach, that was a fun conversation uh from the other day. If you want to check it out in, in order to like learn his communication process. I thought it was very interesting. Um all right, so easier question for you, and I'm being sarcastic. Um Oliver Marmo, your manager at the end of the season, uh, said this quote, and we asked Descalso about it as well. He said, I want a clubhouse full of guys that has one thing on their minds, and it's not themselves. It's winning a championship. So you start by weeding those out. Can you name those players for us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm fucking around, but what, yeah. what did that quote mean to you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I think looking at it, you know, as someone in the clubhouse, you know, a lot of guys in there probably had one of their worst seasons, you know, in, in their careers. So, I mean, it was hard on everybody, not just the front office or the coaching staff, you know, it was hard on everybody, you know, showing up to the field, trying to figure out a way to win. And, you know, maybe some guys having some bad attitudes and no, I, honest, I honestly don't know, but I think it was just a weird vibe all year, you know, just coming in, expecting to win, win our division, you know, and rattle off a couple of wins and then somehow lose four, you know, I just, we found a way to lose and we can never get ourselves out of the rut, you know, and just kind of treading water all year. And, you know, that was my fifth season in the big leagues. And that was the first year we missed the playoffs. So it was, it was a weird year just to, you know, just all around the clubhouse as a whole. Well, if you can't figure out somebody who is the problem, guess who's the <laughs> <Stop>. problem? <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> like if there's no, if there's no jerk on your team, you're the jerk. Am I wrong, Kip? Tell me, tell me if I'm wrong on this. Can't find the fish at a poker game. That's <laughs> You're the fish. Thank you. No Not way. Like no way. Basically, really good from the leading. 
from in the lead. They don't know how to claw out of the, a hole. I, I will say this, okay? I'm, again, not going to point out names. I know the Cardinals right now, if, you re, if you're living under a rock, unless you are, you see they're looking to potentially trade some of their outfielders in their system in general, right? There are a lot of players there. Can you see it being difficult sometimes? Obviously, it's not your position, but being around guys where there's so much competition for those three spots and there's so much mixing in and out. And then you look at Atlanta, for example, they're basically running out the same nine dudes the entire season in their lineup. Does that sometimes cause chaos, even though it's competitive and it's the big leagues? Would you rather it be a little more sturdy? Yeah, I mean, I think especially, you know, our outfield's really young. You know, Jordan Walker came up last year and struggled in the outfield, but hit well. Um, I think, obviously, I've never hit every day in the big leagues, but just hearing guys talk, you know, they, they need those consistent reps. That's what makes them better. That's how they get better. And that's how they get confidence, you know. I mean, if, if you're playing two days and then sitting two days, like, you're not really accomplishing anything. And, you know, I think especially with how young our outfield is, those guys just need to, you know, go out there and fail. You know, they need to have that opportunity to go out there and just experience the ups and downs of a season and, you know, see what it feels like to really be an everyday big leaguer. And, you know, a lot of those guys, you know, Lars was hurt last year. He hasn't played a full season. You know, Walker was sent up and down. And, you know, Carlson's been hurt. So, like, we haven't had those four steady guys, you know, in the three everyday starters that we've, you know, really needed. And just to not have those consistent reps, you know, in any position in baseball, you know, it's going to hurt you in the long run. You're not going to get as good and as get as much out of it. I think there's a luxury to have both. I think Atlanta has a luxury to be able to write whatever they're doing. They're, they're eight, nine guys the same day every day. I think every team needs to know that the 25 guys, and this is what we always did in Cleveland, it's like any tw- the 25 guys you leave for it from camp, it's going to take about 40 to win the championship that year. It's not just those 25 that help that team win games. You need those depth. You need that competition. You need that fourth outfielder, that backup infielder, because when someone goes down, you need someone to plug and play. So it's a luxury to have that depth and competition always. It's Yes, it's nice to have same guys if they stay healthy the whole, whole time, but I think it's good when you have – People who can come in, fill a role, give days off, and still still contribute to winning games. So I like that about your guys' lineup. Yeah, for sure. And if you look at the Giants, I feel like that's kind of what they've done the last few years. You know, they yep. for righties in there, they got all lefties, and if the lefties in there, they got all righties. You know, those guys aren't getting the full season of at bats because they're switching it out all the time. So I definitely think that helps too. Braves won a World Series. The Giants haven't won a World Series doing it. Just, just, just saying. You want to see, you want to see your boy Walker out there as much as possible. The dude's a three hundred hitter. Could be a three hundred hitter in the big leagues. But yeah. I'm going to the more of the hard hitting questions now. Who's the most competitive dude in the fantasy team in the fantasy football right now? Um. So probably. Wayno, he sends the worst trades ever. But funny story, I'm actually not in our clubhouse league this year. I was a, a little hard-headed. I didn't like the way they were picking a uh, draft order. I was hurt at the time and couldn't travel with the team. And I was like, let's just randomize it. Like, that's the fairest way. But they were wanting to play a poker game with, like, three or four dudes that have never played poker in their lives. And all those guys ended up with, like, the worst picks. I was like, that's not fair. And they ended up doing it, and I stood my ground, and I didn't get in the league. So uh, I'm kind of kicking myself now. But uh, I'm in another league um, with my agency and stuff, so that's that's fun. Wait, wait, wait. wait. So what what all went what all went down with this? What, what was it? I don't feel like we're getting all the shady shady business that was going down. Here. <laughs> well, me and Wayne you know, had a different. Me and Wayne, Wayne is the head of the league, all right. And maybe I should, should just be. to him and let him, you know lead the ship and let him do it how he wanted to. Cause now obviously I'm not in the league and he got his way obviously. Um, but I, I just didn't like how we were picking it. I was like, if I'm investing this amount of money, you know, I, I want a little bit of a say with how the pick goes and it didn't work out that way. And they just, you know, everybody, it was like 11 people versus me. They were putting stuff in my locker, you know, just chirping me all day long, just like, you know, you're you're making this harder than it needs to be. And I stood my ground and they left me out. So now now I'm kicking myself. <laughs> Wayno needs to be in a league with Tommy Pham. <laughs> yeah. We need to 
let's I want to see what happens there. That's not right though to do it like a poker thing. That's not random at all. I didn't like that, you know. I was like, that's not mm-hmm. fair. There was literally like three or four dudes watching videos on their phone how to play poker right before the draft and stuff. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not doing this. Kratz, would, would we would we have had the top picks then? Yeah, Ooh. dude. So Ryan, no, no joke. Kratz won an online poker tournament. Let's go. Kip, Kip went to. A, a big ass poker tournament in Vegas with us, and he finished in the money. That, and okay. that's the thing; it is not, it is not luck. No. I mean, sure, luck is involved. That's what I'm saying. I was like, it, luck is involved, Kip. Involved, but there is skill. So, yes. If, if you're if you're a beginner and you're playing with people that know how to play, you're done. you will be done very quickly. Yeah. Yes. So right? what? So what would you? What would you? I, I I see it. I don't do since I won fantasy back in. 2012. I haven't done fantasy since, but my bad. Just hung it One, up. After. Easy, easy, easy Philly league. That's all right. Just 16 grand in my pocket, but there's that. <laughs> Damn. But anyway, what would you rather him do? Because I've been watching it like on Instagram. There's reels of like people who like they have like a whole Olympics. Like you got to throw. Would you would you rather have like a skill competition to be able to get the draft picks, or would you rather like pick out of a hat to pick to see? Who picks out of the hat to pick out of a hat? Yeah, I like the randomness way better. I think it's fair for everybody because whatever you do, somebody's going to be better at it than the next guy, no matter what it is. Um, and to combat his point, I was like, well, let's just hit golf balls like the Phillies did then, and then you'll win first because you're a scratch golfer. Like, that's the same thing. Like, And they didn't see it that way. And, um, but I think just randomizing it is the fairest way, and it makes it more fun that way and exciting, I think. I think you're right. I think you Ryan, stood your ground. We are behind I, you. I respect that, that a lot, okay? I'm a, I'm a pain in the ass on things, too, sometimes. Kratz definitely knows. Kip might know, too. So I stand my ground and get stubborn on shit. And, hey, even if next year it doesn't change, can I make the case that it's a big enough ball club that you have two leagues? One yeah. is non-poker related, right? I mean, it's yeah. a 26-man roster and really 40-plus dudes play. And it would even be cool to get some of the – Upper level, like double and triple A guys that are going to be up in the show soon. No, no, crap. <laughs> they ain't got no. that cash. How much was the buy in this year, Helsley? Since you're not even in the league, it doesn't matter. I think it was 3,000. Yeah. Like, yeah. double A, triple A guys, they're getting like 250 a week. Fair, fair. Okay. But still, is there enough there to have a secondary league? Some I people think would everybody be gave way to Wayno's authority because it was his last hoorah, you know, so <laughs> I just wouldn't have it, you know, I, I stood my ground and, I, and now we're here, so. I respect that. I well, like now that you're a lot. In, you got our respect. Now you're, yeah, a lot of respect, but now oh, you're in the Bobo, you you're, you're in the Bobo agent league. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, neat job, Ryan, here. I'll make sure you stay around with our agency and we'll give you Justin Jefferson, what a great trade. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's pretty competitive, too. We, we got a good league going. Are there other players in that one, too? Yeah, it's like me, Manoa, Bednar, Lance Lynn. Who else? What's the buy in for that one? I think that one was 1500 It was a little cheaper. I mean, um, mix in a position player one time. Tommy Pham <laughs> slaps one guy, and now no position players can get in these leagues. Yeah, no wonder you don't miss the Audi. I think it's all pitchers. I, I don't know. I don't remember everybody that's in it. But brutal, brutal league. Yeah, but technically he's got a teammate now. So Lance Lynn is your new teammate. Have you Lance spoken to him? Lance is probably in like nine leagues. So? Yeah. Yeah, I've spoken to him a little bit, and we've been in the same leagues together for like the last two, three years. So I've kind of gotten to know him a little bit through that. And then, uh, I tried to text him to kind of give me a nice trade, but he, he wouldn't do it. So since we're teammates now, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, so Descalso the other day who played with him back in the day, first go around for Lynn, said he texted him and Lynn responded and said, Kratz, and help me out here if I get this butchered a little bit. I only signed with the Cardinals so I can fuck with you. <laughs> yes. Spot on. That's exactly what <laughs> Are you excited to get a player like this? I, so Wayno's gone. Lance Lynn is also someone who comes on this show frequently, and I'm sure you've seen. He's outspoken. He's fun. He's super well-respected. Also, if he sucks, he's the first person to say, oops, I sucked. I'm going to try and fix it, right? Like, he'll make a million jokes about giving up all the homers last year. Are you excited to get someone like that entering a clubhouse who I don't think anyone's not liked having someone like that before to play around? 
Yeah, I think he's going to be awesome. You know, you see his fire out there every time he takes the ball and his, you know, this is one, two to win out there. And obviously him being a Cardinal before, you know, helps. And, you know, I think he's excited about being home and being back with us and helping us, you know, ride our ship and get to where we want to be. Um, you know, I think he's going to bring great vibes to the clubhouse and, you know, and just, you know, help us overall. I know sometimes, last one here, we'll ask a player, like, if they'll learn anything from a vet. Like, oh, you're going to, like, try and pick up his, you know, his two-seam grip or, blah, you know, whatever, his slider grip. Are you going to maybe try and pick up any of his um, enthusiastic antics <laughs> on the mound? In particular, he grabs for an area when he gets pissed off in a good way after he records a strikeout or gets a big out to end an inning. I don't know about all that. I think that's kind of unique to him. I, I don't know that I've ever really showed much emotion out there, to be quite honest. You know, um, maybe I need to though. Maybe, maybe that helped me out. Maybe I'll do try it. a little bit in spring training. I'm sure the other team would hate it if they see me acting like a a douchebag out there on the mound in spring training when <laughs> do the outs don't matter. But uh, maybe that's the time to try it out. Absolutely. Yeah, Kratz closer persona, right? Dude, absolutely. You don't know. If- you don't know. I mean, you, you already have, like, the intimidation factor. You're already intimidating three of the nine guys in the order because you're, like, you know, a big hulking pitcher, blah, blah. But, like, the quiet the quiet shtick, no, nah, you got to know, like, this dude might put one in my neck. Like, you look at you look at Aroldis Chapman and you're like, ah, the guy's throwing, like, 98 to 100. It's not the 105. And then all of a sudden he got – he got 30% more of the league out after he put 104.5 in the back of Chaz McCormick's knee. So everybody else is now like, uh, so you do it one time. It's like punching somebody when you go to jail. Like you fight one dude. Now you got street cred. So I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I like that. that. that hates you right now, Kratz. Do what? There's some player out there that hates you right now. Me? <laughs> For because Ryan Helsley's going to throw 105 <laughs> in his back in spring training, and he's just going to be like, oh, Kratz, why? <laughs> All right, hey. so good. He's got stuff to think about in the offseason. Uh, Ryan, great to catch up with you as always, dude. Stay warm there, and uh, we'll catch you later on this offseason, all right? Appreciate it, guys. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Ryan Helsley. Super closer on the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, you know, Kip, like there's some guys sometimes where you're in the dugout. We've had a lot of players on that have said this and they're like, ah, oh, fuck. Either game over or they're like, oh, I don't want to face him. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. Robbins Chapman, I agree with Kratz. He was effectively His, wild. Yes. He is like the poster boy now for effectively wild. And there's a few others. Um, Brash. On the Mariners, I feel like has been that guy in the past yeah. too. Obviously, not as big of a name, but like big stuff. And sometimes you don't know where it's going, and that's freaking scary. And that's one other thing for you guys to think about, right? It's you're you're already trying to get the foot down and get as short as you can to catch up to that fastball, and now you have to worry about it not being in your rib cage too, or behind your head, or something like that. You're like, you, I, I equate it to moving up halfway on like an Iron Mike machine, basically halfway up the cage. You're like, I know it's supposed to be around here in the strike zone. Then one goes behind you and you're like, all right, everything's out the window. I'm just, you're in like almost defense mode instead of attacking the baseball mode. It adds an element that makes it just that much harder. If I had known this about you, Kip, I would have been like, as soon as you came into the box, I'd have been like, hey, Kip, like, just be ready, man. Like, I, I don't know. He's, <laughs> he's kind of been everywhere. And you'd been like, wait, you serious, bro? <laughs> Like all of a sudden, it like it just gives you that little. If you have any kind of hesitation, it gives you that's that little bit of like. That's anybody, right? If he, if the guy throwing that hard, if he comes up and in or over your head or something, you're like, oh god, he doesn't know where it's going right now. <laughs> but that's a difference in like a starter like you. You got to be like, look, man, like I'll I'll get him next time. Like I'll get the where a guy like me, it's like, hey, that's your pinch hit. Like, okay, I got. Oh man, he almost hit me. Okay, well that could be on base percentage, so that's fine. Like you're calculating, like can I withstand 103 miles an hour? Okay, everywhere but the rib. Like I, I can't handle the rib. Everywhere else, I'm good. And then you're so you sell back out again, but it, you have, it, you, it gets in your head. You have two, like the the angel and devil on your shoulder. You have two voices in your head. You have one, you're like foot down, be on time, get the baseball, and then the other voice is the rookie of the year. Oh my god! 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 Like I said, 
<laughs> you're fighting. You're hearing both those voices as the pitch is coming. Kratz might even add like a – he's going through something right now too off the field. His head's not there. So I'm, I'm pretty concerned about it. I, I, swore, I swore if we had beaten the Rays in 2020 in the, the COVID year, so we were going to stay at the same hotel as the Astros. The Astros would have come in and played us. The Astros played the Rays and lost. The way Araldis Chapman was talking about Jose Altuve – I was going to go up to Hosey and be like, Hosey, I just I need you to just not be in the box when he's pitching. Araldis Chapman wanted to put a ball through Jose Altuve. Now, obviously, years have years have gone gone by on this, but like when that when those kind of guys like have that, like you said, like he's kind of going through in something right now, like they can do some serious damage. You saw what happened to the back of Chaz McCormick's knee. That was a pitch with conviction let's put it that way <laughs> that's good uh all right by the go ahead no i was just saying that was a pitch with a purpose on that one purpose everybody purpose. saw it heard it they're like okay we're eliminated it's fine Ooh. sorry jazz uh we got bob nightingale from usa today joining us in just a sec he'll be with us got a lot to get to with bob otani update soto update Yamamoto update. He's ready to go. So it's our uh, MLB nine innings winter meetings dish right now to get the scoop from our guy, Bob. Uh, USA Today's finest covering this team out in Nashville right now or covering this uh, winter meetings out in Nashville right now. Bob, great to have you back on. Good to see you. You look well rested at the moment. We'll see how you're doing a few days from now. Um, but let's start with Soto because you had sent out tweets about the Yankees and Padres being far apart. Does it sound like Talks are dead at the moment, and other teams could emerge, especially teams that don't get Otani, like maybe the Blue Jays. I mean, they, uh, they're dead for right now, but, you know, it always happens where someone asks for a lot. The Yankees don't want to give that much. I think the Blue Jays have interest, too. But I don't know, you know, who's all interested. I mean, you've got to pay this guy $33 million. He's going to walk as a free agent. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a uh, – you know, huge value in him. So I, I don't blame the Yankees for saying, wait a minute now, we're not going to just do a one-year rental. Uh, it's not like he was carrying the Padres or anything. I mean, they were underachieved, you know, since he arrived. Not saying it was all his fault, but he was part of the problem. Are you surprised that there aren't more teams involved on Soto and that we've gotten to a point in the industry where teams are like, oh, it's only one season of a player and it's 30-something million dollars? Because on the other side, Bob, you always hear, oh, a team doesn't want to get involved on a player over such a lengthy contract, right? You'll hear the same thing from certain teams about Cody Bellinger, where they'll say, I don't want to sign a player for seven, eight years. So if you don't like that and you don't like the one year, it's like only, what, th two to four years is how you please every front office and ownership group? <laughs> well, I think, you know, when you look back at like uh, Francisco Lindor, Mookie Betts, both traded one year to go. But both teams thought they had a chance to, you know, sign those guys to extensions, and they did. I mean, the Dodgers didn't get anything for uh, Mookie Betts, and uh, you know, uh, Cleveland didn't get that much either for Lindor. You know, a better deal. But I, I think in this case, they know that he's going to test free agent. Uh, he's going to want at least five hundred million dollars. So are you going to give him, you know, five hundred thirty-three million dollars because thirty-three million dollars this year? I just don't think there's a big value on him right now. A year from now, yes. But, you know, when you have to give up players, you know, plus pay the salary, uh, that's, that's, that's a tough ask. So it, I know the talk is, okay, he's a Boris client. He's not, you know, he's not going to sign an extension. Are any of these trades contingent? Because I know some, of, some other trades people have gotten tra or talked about getting traded and they talk about an extension before the trade goes through. Are there any – chances that teams are able to even talk to Soto about an extension? Or is that just a mute point? No, we're not talking. Yeah, mute point. Usually they won't give anybody even 72 hours to do something. Uh, they used to back in the day, but it's very rare now. So I think it's say, like, yeah, you got, you got him for one year. You know, good luck signing him as a free agent. You know, the one advantage you do, if he plays uh, with the Yankees or Toronto, at least he knows the atmosphere, whether he wants to stay there as a free agent. So you do have a little bit of advantage there, but, but that's it. 
So, Bob, being that it seems like the Yankees are not in on Shohei Otani, there's a chance they don't get someone like Juan Soto. I know that they're in on Yamamoto, so are many others, like the Mets and Giants, according to many, including I think you've talked about the Yamamoto market being insane. Where do you think they go? Is Scott Boris just hanging out laughing, being like, Cody Bellinger's price is sky high now because the Yankees clearly need to upgrade their offense. Their offense was terrible last season. Um, And if they're not going to trade for a big bat like Soto, it's not like there are a ton of bats available on the free agent or trade market. No, yeah, I think they could uh, still, you know, get the uh, Korean center fielder, uh, do that as well. But I I think Bellinger falls on a lap. I think if you don't get Soto, they say, you know what, we'll pivot to Bellinger. And uh, I think that the front runner for Yamamoto, he's the opposite of uh, Otani. He wants a spotlight. He wants, you know, the fashion, all that kind of stuff. I think it's, I think it's between the Yankees and Dodgers. I won't eliminate the Mets because they're still in New York. But he, uh, I can't see him signing anywhere else. Okay, I'll take you to Shohei Otani and where your thoughts are at the moment. I mean, I know it's been difficult for anybody to get that much information. But do you have any ideas, any added research or um, whispers about when, where, how much, etc.? I still think he stays in uh, Los Angeles and uh, plays for the Dodgers. I'm not going to rule out the Angels. I, I won't. Uh, San Francisco will probably offer the most money, but he wants to hit. He wants to set records. You know, he wants to hit uh, playing in uh, San Francisco. So I think I can't see him pitching Chicago because of the weather. If he wants to pitch again, he does with the rain outs, the rain delays. Uh, I know Atlanta's in the mix as well. So is Toronto, obviously. At least they got the dome. But I think he stays in the West Coast. We had too many teams at Central that reached out, and he, they were told, sorry, he wants to stay West Coast. He's not interested in coming to your place. I think it'd be fair to be able to root out the Angels. I think if he would have resigned with them, they would have probably done it by now, or he wants to go. He's always been saying he wants to go somewhere to win, doesn't he? He does, but he's very comfortable there, and they treat him great. He pretty much runs his own show. He tells you, you know, when he's going to play, when he's going to pitch. Uh, you know, hasn't talked to the media since August 9th. I'm not sure how many markets that would play in. So I just think the comfort level, you know, hey, Trout stayed there, so he could too. I'm not saying they're the favorites, but I, I wouldn't rule them out. I, re- I really want it just because of the comfort level. Now, you, it's, it's probably uh, fair to say he's probably the one piece, the one big domino that's holding up the market right now, right? He's the one that a lot of teams are in on who have to kind of wait and see for him to make his decision. And Soto, too. Yeah, I mean, with, you know, you've got the big bat. And, you know, it's a, it's a thin market. There's not that many bats out there. Uh, so, yeah, I think once he's signed, once Yamamoto signed, then the market moves. But certainly you don't want to uh, give up a chance to sign uh, Otani, you know, and, and take somebody else. So, yeah, I think once both those guys move, uh, you know, the position player market, if you think about it, is it, uh, very shallow. So I, I think that one could take a while to develop. Just because there's not that many guys out there. I mean, you got Bellinger, you got Chapman. There's a drop off. Bob, you've been covering this industry for a while. Have you ever seen anything like this? I'm not talking about the player on the field, but the free agent process that Otani has gone through and how mysterious it is and how they've kept everything <laughs> so closed up. Um, for example, last year, Judge is the big free agent, and many people um, made the case that. You know, he goes to San Francisco. There's that like kind of awkward video that I think was staged so that it showed that, hey, San Francisco's real Yankees. You better pay a little bit more. And it worked out for him. Otani's like the opposite. We're just no one knows anything. No one knows bids. So have you ever seen anything like this? And do you think it's working? Because it seems like from his camp's perspective, if they don't talk much about him and don't put anything out there. Then someone like him that we're looking at um, won't be covered and, and he won't have to deal with as much publicly. I think there's been actually more intrigue and talk because no one knows anything. And so people just guess and throw random shit out there. Oh, I agree. I I do think it's working. You know, as they, uh, you know, people say people throwing darts out there and guessing at different things. Nobody knows what he's thinking. Uh, He was spotted in San Francisco the other day. That's probably the first, you know, news nugget we've, we've seen, but I, you know, he doesn't need to drum up interest. I mean, how many times you see, you know, agents leaking out, Hey, just met with this team, that team. You know, used to be, hey, you travel to different cities and make sure the media knows about it. Because everybody wants him, he doesn't need to drum up interest. So I think it's working, and it's worked 
purr at your first personality because this guy is just you know almost like a recluse. He does not want to be a, you know around a lot of people. He doesn't want anybody to know his business. Is there a better fit for outside of the Dodgers for Shohei than Toronto? The media market is pretty simple for him. He would be the face of an entire country, which the team would end up making a ton of money on it off field in that sense. And they're really a team that if he goes there, puts them over the top. No, I agree with you, Eric. I mean, the, uh, you know, be a great, great, you know, international signing for everybody. And yeah, let's play, face it, there's pressure. There's pressure on the Dodgers to start winning in the playoffs. There's a lot of pressure in Toronto. They probably underachieved, uh, you know, more than any team that AL East with all their talent they have. They need to win, and they just got a three hundred million dollar, you know, project uh, with the stadium refurbished. They need to sell those luxury tickets. So they need a guy like Otani to assure some sellouts and everything else. They got two more years left of, uh, you know, of, of Bijo and the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with but Shet and Vlad Guerrero. And then, you know, they could be gone. So there's a lot of pressure in that Toronto front office to win now. Hey, Bob, I wanted to get your thoughts on the trade, um, because really that's the only thing that's occurred so far at these winter meetings. It was really kind of before it started. But Jared Kelnick moves on to the Atlanta Braves, gets traded again here. Um, We spoke a lot about this deal earlier in the show. There are a ton of very pissed off Mariners fans right now because it seems like they are cutting payroll left and right. I mean, we joked with Ryan Divish when we spoke to him earlier saying, are the Mariners broke? I'm confused about <laughs> where they're going as a ball club right now. Like, should they be on that documentary from years back as a team? I know it was mostly with athletes, but is there something we don't know about Seattle and the way that they're constructing things? The thing that stood out to me the most was that they had conversations, according to Ken, earlier this offseason with the Rays about a Rosarena and Paredes, and they had to put him on hold because he said that they weren't in a financial spot to take those salaries on. Rosarena's due about nine mil in ARB. That's where the number is projected to settle. Paredes, three million. So now we're down. We're going from will the Mariners sign Otani for 50 plus to can they afford $12 million of two starting players? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they've had a bad winner. You know, remember we had Jerry DePoto saying, hey, we'll won 54% of our games, so the fan base is already upset by that. They're going ballistic right now. Obviously, they're saving money for something. Uh, could they be saving money for Soto? Uh, possibly. Not Otani. And, you know, you know, remember now, Otani wants to win. When people say, hey, he doesn't want to go back to the Angels, they don't win enough. The Mariners have won less than the Angels have. You know, they've been to the playoffs once in 22 years. So Soto could make sense there to save money for him. Otherwise, you know, maybe like you know Ken said, we're a Rose Arena type of deal. So Bob, do you have any inkling of a team that might miss out on doing anything? This happens every year. It happens during the season and in the off season. So for example, this past trade deadline, Giants ended up doing absolutely nothing. Reds ended up doing absolutely nothing. Both of those teams clearly were burned by that. Where you look at the other side, like a team say like Texas, they've done a lot the last two off seasons. They did a lot at the deadline. I know that doesn't always convert into winning, but it seems like right now we've got about five to seven teams that we're talking a ton about that have a lot of pressure on them from their fan base. When I say pressure, I mean people that pay the money that need to see something from them. They're not all going to land superstars. So do you see trouble brewing for any of teams like some that we mentioned, the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Giants, the Cubs, etc. I think you know two teams that could jump out is, is the Cubs. Uh, you know, if they don't get Otani, I don't think he's going to come there. Yamamoto is not going to come there. Uh, if they don't re-sign Bellinger, they could be that team, and it could also be Toronto. If they don't get Otani, I don't think Yamamoto is going there. Uh, if they don't bring back Chapman and, and Bellinger, that'd be a huge disappointment. I think someone's got to take San Francisco money. I, I think he's going to throw up. I think they'll outbid everybody for Otani. I don't think they'll go there, but I think they'll, uh, they've got so much pressure to do something. Never now, they, uh, their, their fan base is really plummeted here. I think it was 17th in baseball last year, the lowest since the new ballpark was built. They need to get fans back in that, at that ballpark. If let's say Toronto does miss out on that, let's say, and all these other teams that you think uh, are in on the Otani sweepstakes and they kind of miss out. 
what kind of names do you see coming up maybe midseason as the trade market kind of develops? Are there any big names that you can see getting moved? I know it depends on if what teams get out to good starts or not, but uh, guys that are in their last year of deals, are their trade – is the trade market going to be kind of another hot stove for us in the middle of this year for teams? It could be. I mean, I think Dylan Cease will definitely be traded, you know, before the, uh, uh, before the winter is out. So I wouldn't count him. Uh, I think last night will be traded, but I would think a uh, Corbin Burns, he could be a guy to trade down the line. I don't think the Brewers will trade him now. I really don't. I think they're still so upset about Craig Council going through their arch rival Cubs that they want to do everything possible to finish ahead of the Cubs. Even if they finish fourth, the Cubs are fifth. They'll be happy with that. <laughs> so I'm not sure they're ready to wave the white flag on this season. So Burns would be that type of guy. Hey, I'll, I'll follow up on Cease with you, Bob. Are you curious about the direction of the White Sox? And I know, sadly, AJ's not on with us today, but he'll have fun again with Chicago tomorrow. I'm just confused because, okay, here's a new GM. They went through tanking. They did that for a while. They had a short window of winning. It did not last long. They did not get the results that they wanted. It's the weakest division in baseball, no doubt about it, for the last few years and looks to be the case for the next several years, including teams like, say, Kansas City that are still not in a good spot. Like, wh Where do you think the White Sox are going here? So if they trade Cease, Kratz has mentioned before, like maybe they should look into trading Robert. Then I'm like, okay, well, now we're completely restarting again and we're on the five-year plan after we just did that you know, it was like a two-year window of trying, and we had six years before that where they weren't. I think they stop at cease. I don't think they win the world to trade Robert because they're talking about just, you know, rebuilding. And like you said, the AL Central is so weak. The last rebuild was a disaster when they had one good season a couple of years ago, ran away with the division, and then got knocked off by Houston in the playoffs. But I think in that division is being so weak, they feel like they can bounce back in 2025. So they need Robert. I, I think he's definitely there. Uh, Cease is, you know, everybody needs starting pitching. It's a time to move him. I don't think they wanted to begin the offseason, but now that people are so desperate, you know, hey, you're going to get Atlanta a bite. You're going to get the Dodgers a bite. Maybe even Baltimore, one of those three teams is going to. So I think they have no choice with Cease, knowing that you're not going to be competitive this year. But I, I think they could bounce back a, a year from now. Who's the best candidate to do like a prove it contract of everyone's out there, you know, right now, nothing's really happening. So we're like, Oh, well, they need this guy. And this guy needs this guy. Who is going to be left player wise at the end and going, Oh crap. It's February 1st. I guess I need to sign like a one year. I don't know what the, you know, the qualifying offer was 20 million. So then he'll sign like a one year, 22 million. Who do you feel like could be that guy? I don't know if there'd be a guy that you know, has to settle for a one-year deal, but when you talk to uh, different GMs, executives, they think it would be a race between uh, a Cody Bellinger and a Josh Hader who is sitting out there February 1st. Bellinger's price tag is very high. Hader wants to become the highest uh, reliever in, paid reliever in, in baseball history. So I think those, both those guys would be you know, uh, uh, long, long days. Uh, I'm not sure about you know, the one-year guy who has to settle for that. I think some of these guys will learn their lesson. Like, you know, maybe, you know, could that happen to a guy like Marcus Stroman? Possibly, but I think everybody needs pitching so much that, that it won't be him. Uh, be interesting. But I, but I do think a Josh Hader and a Bellinger will be out there for a long time. Well, you said everybody needs to sign pitching. There's one name, former teammate of mine that's been out there, been out there as a – uh, interesting way to word it. Trevor Bauer, are there any murmurs? Are there any conversations that you've been hearing out there? Are teams, what's the kind of overall feel? Do you have a pulse on it that uh, people are interested in maybe signing him back into the league? No, I think people think he's untouchable. I haven't heard one whisper. Anyone think right. they're even thinking about this. Uh, remember now, remember Roberto Azuna was outstanding closer for the Astros. Yeah. He had the domestic violence thing in uh, Toronto. People got upset in Houston. So scouts that see him now say he's better than 90, 95% of the relievers in baseball today, but still nobody will, will sign him. So if they're not going to re-sign a uh, Osuna, I don't think they can uh, go back with Bauer. I, I don't see it happening. Okay. W with that being said, I mean, this leads me to a team that's dealing with an off-the-field situation, but I'll, I'll go to multiple fan questions asking about what they're going to do with the players that um, are going to be 
part of the 2024 season, the Tampa Bay Rays, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen with Wander Franco. If I had to guess, though, he's probably not playing next year. So fans asking, what are plans with Glass now? Now we're seeing people throw Rosarena's name out there in addition to Paredes. Do you think that the Rays take a step back or it's more just the normal reshuffling that they do? It, it seems like, according to you, Glass now will probably be dealt. Do you think they go even further with someone like Brandy too? They could, but I think they'll get enough back. I mean, these guys have such a smart front office. I think it's you know, business as usual for those guys. It's amazing they could lose a Wander Franco and still be, you know, a great team. I think people still think they'll win 90 games. I think that that group is an organization, that deep of an organization. But I'm with you. I don't see him playing next year. We'll see what happens after that. Uh, but, no, I think that front office is that good. And I think that's what drives teams like the Yankees and Red Sox crazy, that they can spend all this money and still not be nearly as good as the Rays are. You're right, Bob. I bring it up all the time on this show. There are so many owners – that want to be like the Rays in terms of how they operate their budget and what that looks like on the field, and they just cannot figure it out. Okay, so let's finish with this before you run around that massive country of a hotel again. Um, Multiple questions here in the chat right now. Cole and um, who else here? I'm just looking at him. Cole said, have they said anything about St. Louis going after another starter? Jordan also asking, what do you think about the Cardinals offseason so far? So what do you think of what they've done And because it was so early, do you see them doing anything else? My concern, Bob, is they talked about how they didn't have swing and miss in their rotation. We saw that before the season started. It played out really poorly for them, especially with the shift restrictions now. They didn't get big swing and miss guys just now with three pitchers. They're good. They can eat innings. Gray was one of the best pitchers in the American League. But are they suddenly a lock to win the division? I don't think so. No, they should be better. And I love those guys they signed. I mean, they eat innings. Uh, they average about 108 innings apiece. Uh, you know, Cease, they'd like to have Dylan Cease. I don't see a matchup there. I don't see them having the players that they're going to give up for Cease. Uh, you know, Atlanta, Dodgers, Baltimore make a lot more sense. But, you know, they could bring back a guy like a, uh, you know, a Seth Lugo, a Michael Waka. You know, it's not swing and miss stuff, but just more veterans to help out that rotation. Bob, we appreciate the time. I know you're busy running around there. Go break some news stories for us. Hopefully it's a busy winter meetings. Hopefully Otani doesn't hold it up. Great to see you, and maybe you'll get a few hours of sleep. What do you think, three to four hours a night? Uh, Max, Max. It depends what time the bar opens, the bar closes, and then what time (laughs) the uh, GMs get coffee. (laughs) I know you're on it. You're on it. Good to see you, Bob. (laughs) Take care, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers. Bob Nightingale does a great job, obviously, uh, covering this sport for USA Today, and you can follow him. Um, We'll post some of these clips on our Twitter right now. A quick look at MLB nine innings. Hey, outfield in. Easy out, everybody. Easy out. Like I said... Easy out. another nine innings not so tough now scan the qr code and download mlb nine innings 23 you can see all those features there and uh, they'll be part of our coverage here of winter meetings week so check that out and also we'll post a link to this in the podcast um, in the description as well free to download baby all right Uh, so what we're going to do here is a little bit of an extended slap hands. We'll do about five minutes of slap. Um, I'll say to everyone watching right now, this is one of the most exciting times of the year. Most players have that are free agents have not signed yet. There is a ton of trade talk. We had some great guests on today. There are some lingering questions. So we'll do kind of some rapid fire answers. So if you're watching right now, you have a free agent question about a player or team or anything else, we'll get to it or we'll get to at least a couple of those questions during slap hands right now. So let's slap. Yeah. 
All right, so we'll mix in some questions here. We'll start with Prize Picks Poppy, who said anything on Julio Urias. Obviously, we're not insiders, but I can tell you from what I've read and who I've spoken to, I mean, he was going to be one of the bigger free agents this offseason. Super young, too, to enter free agency because he came up to the show, I think, at age like 20. Um, I think Giolito now is the youngest starting pitcher available on the market because Urias, I believe he's like 26, I want to mm-hmm. say. Yeah, just right? turned 26. He'll play just a season 26. at 26. Damn. that's Because I can tell you, I mean, obviously they're different pitchers, but Kratz, part of Yamamoto's lore is that he's 25 years old. Often pitchers get to free agency, they're like 30. 25-year-old free agent. Now, think about that for Arias. He would have been 26 years old hitting free agency. And I know, you know, a little bit of an up and down year for him as well, but a lot of talent, a lot of pedigree already. He would have been a $200 million pitcher, no? Easily. Easily. I mean, especially with the money that we're talking, you know, we're talking about five years older, Monty getting one, you know, getting up there in his cash. Uh, Let's see, who else did we have? He's he's six years younger than than, uh, Nola, who just signed a seven-year contract. Like, he might have he might have been whatever Yamamoto gets. If Yamamoto gets, I have him down at getting two sixty five because I think he's going to go to the Giants and get overpaid. But <laughs> he might have he might have been a two seventy two fifty kind of pitcher. And now, wow, zero. Oh, no, I remember zero right now. He's not signing. He's not signing this off season. No, it's he's under I, investigation, so he's not going to sign. Nobody's free agent. nobody's touching him. No, there's been multiple domestic violence allegations, so um, that's what happens. So yeah, you're not going to hear much on that front either. I know there's some question marks with some players um, that are being investigated right now. All right, uh, getting a lot of questions about actually a current Dodger superstar. So apparently, Dave Roberts said today that Mookie's going to be a second baseman. It sounds like I guess full time second baseman now. So I'll go to our resident second baseman, Kip. Mookie looked like he could handle it yesterday. Um, so what do you think about the move for him? And the only thing I'm thinking about also is his body preservation. They have him locked up to a very long-term deal. Um, does he maybe prevent injury a little better and stay fresher if he's at second instead of running all over the place and right? No? No, no. Kratz, I'm looking at your face. Are you saying Opposite. Yeah. Yeah, Opposite. Opp- opposite. Okay. They put the best athletes in the world at second base. Let me just. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, were you? Well, your first question. Excuse me, just my computer. Uh, is can Mookie handle it or anything like that? I, I'm not sure. I've seen a sport that guy can't handle. <laughs> to be honest, everything, every video I see of him is just like the most athletic thing I've ever seen. Um, so he'll be just fine. He's too good of a baseball. He's a baseball player first before he's a certain position. Um, but to answer it, no, the, it's a different kind of shuffles in the infield than it is in the outfield outfield. You just short little sprint. You're the game's all in front of you when you're in the outfield, the game's all around you when you're in the infield. So it's a much different kind of quick sprints, quick side shuffles, the hamstrings, you're in a lower squat at times, uh, the movements around the bag, all that stuff that you have to do. You don't have to do in the outfield. You kind of just go catch a fly ball and you throw it in, um, so, but again, I, I, I go back to my first statement is I don't think there's not, there's not much in the game of baseball that Mookie Betts can't handle. Yeah. Can, can he handle it? Yeah, I think there's. And, and keep in mind, they, they say he's going to be second base full time. What happens if something happens? What happens if their right fielder goes down and their best backup is a second baseman? Well, Mookie, we're going to put you right back into right field now and bring in that guy to play second base. It's still a luxury of his flexibility to have and, uh, all the positions that he can play. And the mm-hmm. Dodgers aren't afraid. Dodgers aren't afraid to have that communication. Like, this isn't like a career life-changing move that they're moving in just a second base. Yeah. I think it's I think it's something that they're – but I think you're spot on, Kip. Like, there's no – he'll he'll figure it out. He's like, oh, you want to create a new position? What does that entail? I'll do yeah, that. I cool. Got it. Like, I'm really good at a lot of things. He'll, he'll <laughs> handle it and – Flourish in it, no doubt. Uh, but I'm also guessing this was also a conversation brought across his table too, and talked about amongst him, and asked uh, what he thinks and whether he wants to do it. It seems like he really wants to play that position more so than right field. You definitely get more action. 
middle of the infield's a lot of fun. It's it's where you're absolutely right. It's where the action is. Um, and so it's it's one of those ones. It's almost like a point guard. Like you want him touching the ball the most. So if he's just you stick him out in right field, it's whatever. If I want Mookie touching the ball the most, I want the play going to him as much as it can. Yep. Uh, one more question, and then we'll get to uh, a little bit of news. Um, Cole Cunningham asks, where are the realistic places for Yamamoto? Do you think him or Tani signs first? And, and we've gone over this a lot. I mean, I think kind of, first of all, everyone wants a starting pitcher besides the Mariners because they do have quite a bit of starters plus no money. But um, the Yankees, the Mets, the Giants, the Dodgers, right? Cubs. I, the Cubs to an extent. The, the same teams that we keep talking about, I think, are going to be involved at the top of the market here. Um, and also, which one do you think signs first? I'll say Otani because we do have more transparency on Yamamoto. And apparently after the winter meetings, he's going to meet in person with teams. Sure, that could change if a team just throws the bag. But it does sound like he wants to go through the process. He deserves to go through it if he wants, right? So he's going to be able to sit down with teams, not have it be a total freaking secret, let them get through their winter meetings. And he still has until January 4th to sign. Yeah, no, I think I think something with Yamamoto, he has – we, we say he has a different personality because he actually has shown a personality. We're, it's all speculation with Shohei to kind of figure out what's – going on so i would say i would say that the process for him is going to be a little bit more lengthy than shohei's been in the league he's seen every place that he could possibly go to i think yamamoto you know he could be courted a little bit he was on he was on floor seats the other night at i think it was golden state um so it's it's stuff like that that it's a little bit different for yamamoto so i would agree with you scott that shohei is going to sign first but I think there is there's got to be a sense if you are Chicago that we got to get one of these guys here. Say ya came, and I think it might give. That's why I think the Cubs, as like kind of a dark horse, might have a leg up because he's not afraid of going somewhere where another Japanese player. It's not that oh you have to have a Japanese player to sign Yamamoto. He's just not afraid of it. And Seiya and him played on Team Samurai together. So it's something that there's an opportunity to, to team up with an ex-teammate if, if you go to Chicago. All right. You guys got me, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just making sure. Okay. So last thing I want to do is uh, preview Ken Rosenthal's fair territory. And we'll do that by showing you a little clip that is related to some news about the Angels. It has to do with a rule that's not going to change, and it has to do with what Artie Moreno, the owner of the Angels, thinks is a hard salary cap. So listen to Ken Rosenthal listing his dork of the week on fair territory. They loaded up at the deadline. Seemingly, we're going to go well over the luxury tax. And then they dumped all those guys, five of them it turned out, five players lost on waivers on August 31st, but giving their fans whiplash, and for what? They traded two prospects, debate how good they are for Lucas Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez. They waived them a month later. Congratulations, you got under the luxury tax threshold. That's fantastic for the Angels, I guess. But, Artie Moreno, the way you've run your team, you're a repeat winner of this award, and if things don't get better in Anaheim some point soon, I trust that you're going to win this award again. <laughs> nailed it Ken. shots fired Your favorite, i love it so fair territory body. is out there for the world to watch and to listen to topics include update on otani and soto markets pressure on the yanks who's going to play shortstop for la his favorite winter meetings moves obviously dude and dork of the week which you just heard one of those and he answers more questions in grill and ken so there's news related to what the Angels did as well. Uh, Buster Olney put out today that MLB will not change the rules for 2024 after the Angels' late season salary dump. So what we termed a new phrase, the dump deadline, Kip, where guys were surprised and didn't even know how it worked that half the team, as Giolito mentioned to us the other day, was just suddenly put on waivers and shipped away. Um, that's not going to change. So teams still will be able to do that in the future if they'd like. The thing for the Angels, too, is that um, 
they're going to lose Otani and they'll get compensation for that. A second round pick instead of a fourth round pick. Woohoo. Um, but I just want to reiterate, like I said, at the top of the show, if they had gone over by a million bucks, they would have paid 200 K like it's nothing that that's, that's what they get for saying Shohei Otani's name at the ballpark from a sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. But if they go over now the next year, but the next year when they do start, like it resets the whole, the whole penalty system, which is huge. So a team is not going to go a million dollars over. So that's why they kept this rule in place because that is a huge 40 slots in the draft, or it's, I think it's like 47 slots in the draft that they move up when Shohei signs somewhere else. That's huge. That's a No, but Kratz, between... not, that's not the rule I'm talking about. I'm talking about the dump deadline where you can do the right. waiver process. The, right, because the, the luxury they had to tax. dump that. They had to dump that. If you're, if you're right, they were right at that border. They were yes. afraid, not afraid of going over. If you're a million over and they don't change that rule, you're stuck. Now that's one year that you went over. I get it. But you can it's reset only... it the next year. Yeah, but then you're then you're being accused of resetting it the whole year. But Kratz, do you think the Angels are going to spend this coming season like they did last year? Like, does it even matter? They're, it's they're going to go under it. They always go under it. Artie Moreno treats it like a hard cap. I don't think they've ever gone over it. So I agree with you. For teams like the Yankees, the Mets, etc., it you keep getting penalized more and more if you're over it. If you're a repeat offender, the Angels aren't a repeat offender. They're never an offender, so it doesn't matter for them. Okay, but I mean, you're talking about an owner that whether you agree or disagree, the dude has signed Mike Trout to four hundred million, signed Rendon, whether it's a good it's a yes. good signing or not. Yep. He signed he signed Pujols back in the day. He's signing guys, and I think if you're always under, then you're like, okay, well, this is my chance. I can go over if I actually ever want to sign a pitcher. Not saying he's going to. I'm saying you don't want to go under. You don't want to go over by a million, and then it's like, oh, crap. If we had just been able to have our dump deadline. Dump deadline? I'm, I'm good with the dump deadline. I'm, I'm glad they kept it. You know what? Show me your true colors, teams. If you want to dump everybody you just picked up, go for it. See what happens in the see what happens in the stands the next season. See if teams because now you can't just hide. You we'll call you out on this show. You can't just hide and be like, oh, I didn't even know that they dumped everybody <laughs> from their team on the waiver wire. Yeah. It's a good call. Um, so anyway, much more on fair territory with Ken. Uh, that's it for us today. We'll be doing this again, obviously every day, every weekday, all off season long, especially during winter meetings. And if, for example, Otani decides to sign tonight, we'll hit it live and we will cover it here on FT like we always do. So stay tuned on that front. Many more writers and insiders with all the real talk going on throughout the winter meetings will join us. So Keep submitting questions too. Like if, if I didn't get to some of them, you can hit us up on Instagram, on DMs, Twitter. Oh, Kratz hats. That looks like the Orlando Magic. New Haven Ravens. It's not even a team anymore, but in New Haven, they played at Yale's field. Oof. An absolute dump. But... <laughs> <laughs> Stick hats. Unique Perfect. Colors. That's why we talked about the dump deadline today, Kratz. Dump deadline. <laughs> Kip, good to see you, dude. Good to see you guys. Cheers, everyone. We'll see you Tuesday or maybe sooner if news breaks on FT Live.